All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, it's an amazing turnout. Nearly 100 of us here already. Uh, and, and we only send out 250 invites. So <laughs> it's really cool to see. Um, I'm going to share my screen. We're just going to quickly uh, talk through some stuff uh, about the you know grammar rules, expectations, all the rest of it. And then we can uh, get into it. Um, we have a full day ahead of us. I think we're going to hear from 17 founders, which is pretty amazing. And then there's open discussion areas and all the rest of it, uh, just like you'd find in a normal conference. But we can, we can get to that. I think just before we do so, um, there's one kind of thought I'd, I'd like to leave everyone with as per, if you will, a flavor for the day, which is that uh, ah, this uh, stop sharing things on the bottom of my screen. I'm guessing that's blocking the way. OK. Yeah. Um, the moment we find ourselves in, in society is clearly a moment of, of change. The pandemic and the general political upheaval of the last few years has, has left society at a moment where it appears to be pivoting. Um, this is obviously a potential danger, but also an opportunity. In this moment, it's pretty clear that we can collectively uh, start to define the, the new rules for how society should work. Um, and I think the area that we're focused on, at least in the Arweave community, is how the web should work. And this, I believe, is, um, is almost our calling as, a, as an ecosystem to build the tools required to keep cyberspace free in the future. And I, I fundamentally believe that the people in the room around you here, um, around 100 people now, it, these are the people at the core of this mission. It's, it's, been, it's been incredible to see the Arweave community grow over the last four years and to reach a point where we're at our first, um, not sure whether it's going to be annual or not, but our first major conference and see all these people here is really mind-blowing, frankly. Um, from I think my perspective and this perspective of most of the the core team and the core community that that have seen this thing grow over the over the last few years, um, it appears to me that the people sitting around you are the people that are going to build the tools that are going to enable us to keep the web free in the face of um, what I would say is some adversity at the moment. It's very clear that the old web is. Um, is becoming increasingly centralized and, and arguably locked down. Uh, this, I don't think, is what many people in this room want, if any. Um, and I think, yeah, you'll find that the people around you are the people taking active steps to make cyberspace free. That's extraordinarily exciting. I think this is a, the vanguard, essentially. So, so I'm, I'm very, very privileged and, and happy to be here amongst you all. Um, it's amazing to see. So I think the core question of the day has to be, how can we collaborate to build a web that society needs now? What can we do to make sure that the next um, version of the yeah, of cyberspace is freer and fairer than the last one? Um, and, and I would like, if we could, to essentially take this as the core theme of the day. Like When we move between the different talks, there are going to be many talks. There's also an area for chit chat and coffee. Um, yeah, if we can keep the, the conversation, if you will, on this question of how are we going to build this thing um, collaboratively, I think it'll be an amazing use of all of our time. The people here around you, well, yeah, we can set some expectations. So what, the first thing you've got to understand is this, this gathering is not just random people. This is actually, we only sent 250 invites um, to people selected by the founders in the ecosystem. So this is the core of the core of the Arweave community around you. Um, yeah, you won't find anyone here that is not a, a strong Arweave initiate, initiate uh, if not um, you know, <laughs> die-hard uh, type that's been around for years. So it's amazing to see the community grow. But what we wanted to focus on here was just the people that are doing this like almost every day, all the time, trying to help build this new web together. And that, I think, is going to allow us to keep the quality of the conversation extremely high, extremely focused on the big questions, which is how are we going to grow this ecosystem um, so that we can you know, essentially take on the centralized web providers and build a better web? Uh, what are the key things that we need to work on as a community um, to make things better and, and to make that possible in the long term? And, and then, yeah, what's going well and what we need to improve in, in, in the form of like ecosystem cooperation? So, so these are the key things. Um, but the cool thing I think you'll find is that this, <laughs> these are all your friends by proxy already. 
you've likely spoken to them all on Discord. Um, it's a big family, but this is all pretty much family here, which is, is amazing. And, and that family is surprisingly big at this point. OK, I think the fundamental goal needs to be learning from each other and starting new collaborations. So we've all seen that the way this space works seems to be that you know people start talking to each other on Discord or, or some of the other chat platforms, and they find that there's an, a thing that they're collectively interested in, you know, two or three people. Um, and then suddenly they start working together. And then collectively, they build something that is greater than either of them have, could have done singularly. More of this will lead to a stronger ecosystem, will lead to a better web eventually. Uh, and so I think that's what we need to focus on in, in terms of like, outcomes uh, for the day. And the key thing, I think, to understand is also that while the talks are the main event, and we're going to listen to uh, talks from, I think, 17 founders today, which is incredible, um, the corridor track is also uh, super important as well. So this is really just milling around outside and talking to one another. Typically, with conferences in cyberspace, you have this problem where there is one track, and it is the talks. And everyone attends the talks and nothing else. And this stands in like stark contrast to in-person events, where actually almost no one attends the talks. And everything happens. All of the important stuff happens in the corridor while people are getting coffee. We're very lucky that um, I think, frankly, due to the pandemic, uh, the, the, what you say, the tools are now available to have a kind of uh, it's almost like a geographical experience, like a, like a 2D uh, space experience over the internet together as a, as a conference. Um, and this allows us to actually have areas where people just mingle and talk to one another in separate conversations away from the talks. So no one is going to be offended if you choose to do that. I think that's actually great. It's really important that everyone just gets to know each other more, hangs out. Um, I'm trying to avoid saying uh, shoot the shit, but that is what it is. Just talks about the random stuff that's happening and how we might be able to work together on um, yeah, initiatives in the future, essentially. That is the key outcome we want to gain from all of this. And I think it's what the community needs right now. Um, yes, and so that is likely going to happen just when you bump into people at random and talk to them outside. So no pressure to stay in here in the main conference room. There's going to be amazing talks from all of the founders. They're going to be super exciting and, and really interesting and deeply technical. Everybody here has been briefed, uh, apart from in the, the demo day, which is coming from the uh, Open Web Foundry uh, program. This is not pitching. These are not long pitches for startups. These are you know, observations about where the space is. I tried to build this thing. This is how it went. This is what I've learned. This is what you might not want to know. And here's something I built, and you can use it in your own tools. Um, and you can do it like this and this and this. Now, this is what we're focused on in the talks. They're all going to be super helpful in that regard. Um, but also, yeah, please <laughs> don't feel any pressure to stay here. Just go talk to people. That's what it's all about. OK, last thing, obviously, have fun. Um, I think one of the most incredible things about the Arweave community and why I'm so excited to be part of it is that everyone here is so friendly. Like, this is something that's <laughs> Sometimes a little bit hard to come by in, in crypto, but, but it is true. It, almost everyone in the RWE ecosystem is immensely friendly to one another. Uh, so this is just going to be a great place to hang out and you know, chat to your existing friends, make new friends, all the rest of it. Um, that's it from me. Uh, I'll come back at the, the end of the talk, but uh, at the end of the talks today. Um, but other than that, yeah, I'll, I'll see you guys around. Thank you so much for coming. You guys really are the core of this thing we're building. And I'm just so honored and uh, yeah, privileged, I guess, to, to, to be around you all. So thank you. I can't wait for all of the talks and all the conversations we're going to have today. OK, let's get to it. All right. Um, well, hey, everybody. Um, my name is Tate, and I'm I'm here to to give a, a presentation on on a few different things. But uh, let me just share my screen really quick. Let's see here. Here we go. Okay. Cool. Can everyone see this? Uh, we can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I can't see it, so let me just go to that window. <laughs> Apologies. Um, 
Okay. So, um, yeah, again, my name's Tate, and, and this is founding Blink in a profit-sharing ecosystem. So what I'm about to say applies to, to what I've learned as, as an early founder in this ecosystem and also, um, you know, things that, that you might be able to learn from, from some of my experiences. So, yeah, th this talk is going to cover, you know, who am I, what is Virto, uh, how can you get involved in, in Virto? as well as the importance of, of ecosystem composability and, and some reflections that I've had as a founder over time. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. Um, I like to ski. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm also a student working on graduating high school right now. Um, and I'm also the founder, a founder of the Virto Protocol, which got started back in um, around July of, of 2020. Uh, but I discovered Arweave in late 2019 and um, really began building in, in Q2 of 2020. Um, my first project was, was an open source project that, that attracted a, a, a developer community. And that led to me being able to, to put together a team to work on, on the Virto protocol. Um, so things really just snowballed after weekend project is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but yeah, so, so what is Virto? Just really quick. Uh, so Virto is, is a way for people to trade um, Arweave native tokens uh, on top of the PermaWeb. Um, so Virto is powered by a network of, of trading posts, which are like servers that can send and receive people's orders. Um, and Virto was mainly <laughs> created in, in the beginning to swap between profit sharing tokens R and Ethereum. Uh, however, now with the, the big NFT boom, um, people are now using Virto to trade NFTs, and so that's resulted in an interesting, uh, a, a, an interesting you know, strategy change on, on our half, but I'll, I'll get into that later. Um, so how can you get involved with Virto? Uh, so the main thing, like as a developer, we're mainly looking for, for people that are interested in starting up these trading posts. So the code base is completely open source, um, and anyone can start up a trading post. They're just required to, to hold and stake Virto tokens. Um, that is like hugely beneficial to the protocol because it means that your trading post can, um, can effectively act as the, the, the matchmaker between people in, in, in making these orders. Uh, so by being a trading post, you can also earn you know, fees as the trading post itself. Um, but you can also earn fees from the, the Virto tokens that your trading post stakes. Um, with regards to, to contributing to the code base itself, we're actively working on a caching server. Um, and so I'm sure that, <laughs> you know, it, that is, we're going to have some, some scalability uh, questions there and contributing to, to that and collaborating with us would be very much appreciated. Uh, the trading post infrastructure itself is another massive piece. Um, the front end, you know, it's, it's made in React and Next.js. We're currently migrating from, from Svelte. <laughs> Svelte. Uh, and also SmartWeave contract development, uh, which is becoming more and more popular over time. Um, so the, the main thing that, that I want to, to, that I want people to take away from this is that we're here for you. Um, Virto is, is a Lego store for your Legos. <laughs> and, and I'll get into more about what that means later. Um, but basically, you know, if you're working in this ecosystem and you're trying to, to build something, you know, my DMs are open, anyone on the team's DMs are open, uh, we're here to help you. And, and we've tried to make Virto as easy as possible for people to list new types of tokens, um, which is how the, the NFT, you know, situation kind of happened. We, we made Virto like an, an open protocol where every token was supported by default. And so when people started minting these NFTs, they were supported um, natively by the protocol and just people started trading them. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're really, we're here for you. Um, so one of the tools that, that our team has built to, to help you out um, is called Astatine. And basically what it allows you to do is um, distribute a set of tokens over a period of time. And you can control how many tokens you distribute um, you can control the curve as, as seen in that picture there. Um, and you can also control the amount of time that they're distributed over. But, but the main thing is that you can set the criteria for which these tokens are distributed, which is immensely powerful because um, you can incentivize people in your community 
to do pretty much anything that you want. Um, so for example, our drive is a great example or use case. Um, our drive has, has been using Astatine for quite a while now. Um, and what they did in my understanding is basically whenever people were uploading data to our drive, um, they could also passively be receiving these R drive tokens proportional to the amount of data that they uploaded uh, any given day. And so based off of this curve here, you know, you can incentivize the early adopters to, to try out the protocol um, because they'll be able to earn the most tokens. And, and later on, you know, that curve levels out. But really, you know, it's, it's flexible for you to do whatever you want with it. Uh, our verify is also another great example and they've they've been using this for a while too so you can find that at, at github.com slash maximus black slash astatine um, the second thing is is the virto library um, and the tldr there is you can you can add trading functionality and analytics into your applications uh, in three lines of code which means that people no longer need to go to virto.exchange to be able to um, you know, trade the, the asset that you're working on or assets for that matter. So NFT marketplaces, you know, if you want to add trading functionality, you can use the Virto library. Um, I, I know of quite a few projects that are actively working on implementing this. Community XYZ has already implemented this so that when people are browsing through the different communities, um, if someone wants to buy some of the tokens straight from that discovery page, they can easily do that. Um, and we're also actively working on a, a rewrite of this library, um, which will make it much, much faster because right now the library is iterating through all of the contracts that are supported by Virto. Uh, and because of the way our weaves, you know, uh, lazy evaluation of, of these contracts works, that can take some time. Uh, but we're working on that caching server that I mentioned earlier, which will take the load time, uh, you know, probably a <laughs> hundred times down, uh, which is, is going to be huge. And of course, that'll be optional as well. You'll be able to turn that off uh, if, if the API goes down or something like that. But um, yeah, the Virto library is, is there for you. And if you have any questions about integrating that, um, you can easily get in touch with us and I'll, I'll be able to give you some links on how to do that soon. Um, but yeah, so with regards to ecosystem composability, I, I think that this is one of the the most important things to keep in mind when developing things in this ecosystem, as, as Sam was mentioning earlier. Um, so, you know, as, as a custodian of this protocol, um, we kind of feel that it's our responsibility to create standards for things that don't exist and always support the standards for things that do. Um, and, and that might seem, you know, small, but what it means is that over time, as people continue following these, these ideologies, um, you can end up building something that is instantly compatible with like 50 other platforms down the line. Um, and it's, you know, it's an immensely scalable and powerful concept. And I can't stress the importance of, of why you should do that. <laughs> um, it's going to be beneficial to you in the long run. It's going to be beneficial to your users in the long run. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's overall, it encourages collaboration between these different applications in the community. Uh, which is huge. So a great example of this would be uh, Descent.Land. So I know Sam has touched on this on Twitter in the past, but I, I thought that this was a really profound tweet. Um, because if you think about it, Descent.Land is actually a combination of Arweave's data storage with Rverify so that people can verify you know, that they're legitimate humans. <laughs> um, community XYZ, that's what Descent.Land's token is made of. Um, Koi, which allows for attention rewards on these, these posts that people are creating. Squad, which allows people to index all of the posts and all of the profiles that people are creating um, and track that cross-platform. Uh, and also Virto, because the Decent.Land token is compatible with, with the Virto protocol because it's compatible with community XYZ. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, it, it's like someone, you know, just went on and created this, this protocol and, and all of a sudden it's compatible with, you know, six different things in such a short period of time um, instantly because they, they followed that system of, of ideals there. Um, so I'd also like to give a few reflections that I've had uh, in my time as a founder. Um, you know, I'm, I'm relatively young. This is, 
I haven't been a founder for very long. You know, it's still still very, very new to me and I'm always learning. Uh, but these are some things that I've learned in my time um, and in my experiences. So number one, you know, it's totally OK not to understand um, with with our weave. A lot of people are coming into this ecosystem and the technology is completely foreign. Um, the way that the smart contracts work are, are not like what most people are used to. And so that can be confusing to a lot of people. But if you embrace the learning mindset, you can pick this up because it will allow you to surround yourself with the people that do understand this or are learning just like you. And you can collaborate with those other people while you're learning in, in a fun way. Um, and beyond our weave, you know, this is a great uh, mindset to have because you know, if you're working on doing something for the first time, um, you don't want to come across as, as arrogant or anything like that uh, because people are going to want to help you if you don't come across that way. Um, and so, you know, the, in short, it's okay to, to be stupid and, and say that, you know, I, I don't understand something. Can you explain that better? Um, with fundraising, you know, it was my first time fundraising a, a few months back and um, embracing the learning mindset there is, is what got me through it. <laughs> So yeah, I, I think that that's a really important lesson to be learned, um, and and I'm sure that you know, it, it's probably somewhat obvious, but I, I still think it's really important to say. Um, so number two, emphasis needs to be on user experience. Um, a, a lot of emphasis, not all of it, but <laughs> certainly like it, we have a big opportunity here because Arweave is giving us the technology that we need to reach these mainstream audiences. Um, you know, a lot of blockchains are, are very focused on DeFi right now. And, and DeFi is great. It's very cool, very powerful stuff. Um, but the chances of, of a, a banking application, for example, reaching uh, a mainstream audience as, as, as compared to a social media application is, is not really comparable there. Um, and and we gives us the, the potential to create these, these banking applications. And I don't like to say banks because everything's decentralized. Um, but it also gives us the potential to create these immensely powerful social media applications, as I'm sure you're going to hear more about uh, later today. Um, and so if we put a large focus on user experience, that's going to massively increase the chances that we have of reaching these mainstream audiences, which will be great for your community. It will be great for the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, it's also something to be proud of, <laughs> you know, having a good user experience just kind of feels good to you and also the people that are using your stuff. Um, so, yeah, I would say that that's very important. Um, number three, you can see this two ways, bad and good, uh, but it's important to know that everyone has incentives. Um, so make sure to stay mindful of that and also find alignments of those incentives whenever possible. Uh, because if you can find an alignment between yourself and another person, you both are going to be incentivized to contribute value in, in, in the same way and collaborate uh, on that. And so if you can collaborate with other people, um, there's a really great chance that you can make a bigger impact than, than you could if you just did it with yourself. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> just make sure to stay mindful. People have incentives. Um, I tend to be an optimist about this, but it's also important to know that this can also be um, something to watch out for. You know, people people might try to take advantage of you. Uh, luckily, I've never seen this in the RWEB ecosystem, um, but it's important to, <laughs> you know, we, we just need to stay mindful of, of that that concept. Um, so number four, this, this is kind of, um, you know, this might not apply to everyone, but, but for us and in our developments, it, it, it proved to be extremely beneficial to, to develop in public. Um, and the reason why is because we are building protocols, right? In this ecosystem, we're building a protocol. And the goal is not only to have people using that protocol, but it's also to have developers coming to it and building things on top of what you've built. Um, and so if you can attract the right people, in this case, developers, you can speed up the progress to, to get people to develop on top of what you're doing. Um, so developing in public for us was enough to, to get other developers looking at the code base and what we've done. And it encouraged them to do things like start trading posts or try using the Virto library to, to build something of their own in their own application. 
Um, and it also really improved our community engagement because people were now asking questions about how do I build these things? Uh, what is the best way to, to go about using this, this library? Um, things like that. And so for us, it, it was really, really beneficial. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend that. Um, and number five, this one might be kind of self-explanatory, but again, I'd like to make sure I put an emphasis on it. It's important to network and collaborate with as many people as you can, um, because you never know what opportunities someone else is going to be able to give you. It's, it, you know, I, I probably, you've probably heard this from a lot of different people, but for me, um, there have been a lot of times where I've, I'm, I'm kind of an introvert, and there have been a lot of times when I've been hesitant to go and, and network with other people. Um, but I don't regret doing it at all because as soon as I did, I realized that there were all of these random opportunities to meet other people that, that might be able to add value in other ways to what you're doing. And also, it helped me make a lot of friends <laughs> in this online environment. Um, and so, in other words, it's important to, to add value in more places than just your own uh, because people are going to respect that and people are going to be encouraged to also add value to what you're doing because they think that it's cool that you're helping other people out as well. Um, so with regards to the future of, of the ecosystem, I, I don't have anything you know specific per se. <laughs> I don't have a master plan of, of where I think our weed's going to go. Um, but what I would say is that there's a ton of room to build all kinds of things in this emerging market. And I say it's an emerging market because as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people are focused on DeFi right now, but Arweave gives you the capability of building really, really powerful uh, things like social media applications and things that are other, other things other than DeFi for that matter. Um, I should also say that permissionless innovation, um, building in these composable ecosystems will, will enable unforeseen use cases down the road. Uh, because if you get the right puzzle pieces together or, or Lego bricks for that matter, um, someone might be able to look at that thing and say, you know, if I add a Lego brick here, I might be able to build something that that has never been done before, that no one has ever thought of before. Um, and so, yeah, enable you working in this composable ecosystem has has fostered permissionless innovation at a protocol level. Um, and in in my short experience, I, I found that in, in such a short period of time. Um, People are are building incredible things and with you know unforeseen use cases that, that we had never thought of when when Virto came around. The best example is is NFTs, um, and also profit sharing will enable countless new mechanism designs because all of which will, they they'll be free to to exist on our weave. Um, these the power of micro tipping is I think bigger than a lot of uh, what people might realize. Um, it makes a lot of things possible that, that weren't possible before. And I don't want to talk too much about this um, because it's, it's really up to, to your interpretation and what you see with it. Um, but it's made a huge impact on this ecosystem and it's made a lot of things that wouldn't otherwise be possible, possible. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> if you want to get in touch, feel free to reach out. Um, our Discord is verno.exchange slash chat and you can find me on email as well. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much, Tate. Okay, so um, before we jump to the next talk, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I thought that we were going to come up and uh, outline the schedule after after I spoke, but um, that's okay. It was an amazing start to the day, uh, Tate. Thanks so much. Okay, so the basic principle here is that we're going to have, I think, six or seven more uh, founder talks, which are really going into the depth of um, the things you can build, as Tate just outlined, you know, experiences in the ecosystem, stuff we can work on. Um, amazing infrastructure that already exists. And then just checking my schedule here, I believe at approximately 1.30, we're running about 10 minutes late already, which is a good start. Yeah, approximately 1.30 Eastern time, uh, we'll go to demo day presentations. These are gonna be more like pitches um, for founders that are earlier in their, their um, you know, journey uh, in the ecosystem uh, from the Open Web Foundry. So yeah, with that, let's uh, take it away with Phil from our drive, who's gonna tell us about the things they've been building. Phil, there you are. Hey, take it away. Hey, Sam. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. How are we looking? Uh, 
Yeah, I see you down here. Yep. Great. So this is behind the build with our drive. Um, today, I'm going to go deep into a couple areas that are core to us, um, our community and our open protocol. Um, I'll share some of my lessons learned of being a founder in the ROV ecosystem. Um, hopefully, you can learn something new, whether it's about our drive or how you can manage your community or build your app. My name is Phil. I'm the founder of R Drive. I was recently a system and solution architect for KPMG, a uh, crypto miner, node operator since 2017, and an R Weaver since the testnet. If you haven't heard about R Drive yet, uh, let me just explain it real quick before we talk about all the details behind it. Um, R Drive is a cross platform file sync app built using R Weave. Really easy, familiar, uh, intuitive user interface. Offers complete privacy using uh, RFS, our, our protocol that we'll talk about. Quick, easy file sharing. You're only paying for what you save. No subscriptions. It's the beauty of Rweave. And it's community owned. So what do I mean by that? Community owned. Um, our drive is not just an app, but it's actually backed by a profit sharing community hosted on Rweave. And it's kind of like a DAO, but a lot more. Uh, but what's the point of it, right? Why even bother with a profit sharing community? Um, and here are some of the reasons that kind of have struck me over the past few months. Um, of, of why I think it's important to kind of use this model. First and foremost, a profit sharing community gives you a unique uh, go-to-market strategy, right? You have this token that you could use as an incentive to attract users uh, as well as talent. Uh, it is based off of a DAO, right? So you get the benefit of decentralized governance and design. So your community actually has a say in the fate of the applications with some of the uh, decentralized governance tools that, uh, that we have. Um, the tokens themselves can actually enable some really neat things uh, and app features, uh, as well as can open up some different protocols. So again, it's something you just wouldn't be able to do without this kind of model. Um, having a profit sharing community really aligns the motives for not just your community members, but your developers, you know, your core team for that real long-term success. Um, and finally, and, and you know, I think Tate was, was talking about some of these things, but it's, it's just more fun. It's a little more unique, right? You have more opportunities to, to network and communicate with people around the world. And I've met so many people in this process so far. Um, so I think this is why it's, it's, it's worth bothering with a profit sharing community. Um, but we had a thought one day, uh, communities, it's very open, broad term, uh, different meanings to many, right? All the time, especially as, as an architect, I write all these technical documents, uh, we write them Quite often you see Bitcoin improvement proposals, Ethereum improvement proposals. How come there's not one specific for the community? So what we did, because um, we couldn't find any examples of this, we actually created one ourselves. Uh, shout out to, to Punk, Puppy J, Islander, you know, the guys really helped craft this, this uh, proposal. Um, but after a couple months of putting our heads together, we came up with what we call the CIP 2021. Um, I encourage uh, you guys to kind of uh, follow along with the, the different subjects in here because we felt it was important to really analyze uh, the areas of the community and just get it all out there, right? So this is the CIP is a one-year proposal and it covers the most important topics for us, like our mission and purpose, the community roles, the governance and, and settings around that, our tokenomics, the platforms we use, and even some of the, the marketing strategy um, that we want to uh, go through that over this year. So let's maybe go into the, the key pieces of it. So it was really important for us, and I think it's important for everybody to just clearly define what your community's mission and purpose is. So for our drive, our mission is to create the best solution for anyone to store their data permanently. Nice, simple, easy to understand. And our community's purpose is to support, learn, and inspire one another to build and enhance the awareness of our mission. Right? Every founder, I think, should make these simple definitions, not just for yourself, but for your community. And we don't just have one type of person or skill set that we've seen so far in, in our drive. Um, so we've started to identify the different subgroups that actually make up our larger community. So we have our general drivers, which have the soft skills, you know, like marketing, communications, content, design. Our code drivers are our developers, engineers, real technical people. Our new group, the test drivers, help us out with providing early feedback and, you know, reviewing some of our designs and, and functionality. And then, of course, our community members. Those are the token holders, the people who see the benefits in, in uh, uh, keeping the R drive token and staying in touch with us. Uh, perhaps we add to these groups in the future as we see things forming. And we are trying to take an organic view of this, meaning we're not trying to force certain groups, um, but we'll see what happens. The community could always adjust. Um, it was also very important for us to allow anyone to share their voice 
in the most comfortable means that they can. Um, so we have a few different channels. And again, we're really clear about what you can use for, for what type of uh, discussion, but we use Slack for our, you know, our core private team, uh, chat, Discord for our tech support, Telegram announcements, Twitter, LinkedIn announcements. You know, and I think it's also really important to have a defined support process specific for, uh, for health issues, bug reporting. So we also have that as well. And these things are, again, defined in the community improvement uh, proposal, so we know what to expect uh, over the next year. One of the things that we're, we're missing, we may see uh, a need to have, is some kind of private community uh, group area. Um, right now, it's really just kind of the core team and, and the, the general public. So maybe there's something in between there that, uh, that we might look to utilize in the future. Um, we definitely have a, a lot about our token in the community improvement plan, uh, right? That's important to how we build our community and, and how we kind of release our app. Um, but in the plan, in the proposal, we identify our token utility, right? There's two main uh, uh, two main usages that we have right now. Primarily, it's a profit sharing community, right? So all of the profit we earn through our applications are distributed to our token holders, and then you can also stake that token to participate in any of our community governance and finance. So it's, it's a staple to our our uh, community token there. In the future, we're looking at potentially opening up other. Uh, uh, things with staking. So, for example, if you stake your tokens, maybe you earn certain settings in our drive, achieve certain things, get new features, maybe you have to spend the token on certain things. So we want to be open about um, what the utility will be in the future. So maybe in the CIP 2022, we introduce a new uh, usage model. Mentioned that being a community member and staking the tokens gives you the chance to participate in our governance. Um, so we use community XYZ to do that. What I have here is just all of the, the standard settings that any community XYZ uh, owner gets. So these are the settings that we have. Definitely encourage everybody to think long and hard about their own DAO settings. Um, you have four types of votes you could use. Um, what we've done in our drive is we uh, force users to stake their tokens for a minimum of seven days, a maximum of three years. And for a vote to pass, 51% um, have to vote yes. So you have to have that 51% support level. And 15% of the whole community needs to vote. So if only 10% of the vote weight goes in, the vote won't pass even if everyone votes yes. Um, so I think these are really important settings to, to understand and communicate out to your community members. What we also did was we defined a voting schedule, right? In the U.S., every four years we vote for a president, right? So it makes sense to have some kind of schedule for your important DAO votes. So what we decided to do is on the first of the month, we have our major votes. And every week, um, we could submit minor votes. And this is to allow people to expect when certain votes are coming. Um, we definitely want to be very forthcoming with what we're submitting for votes. And anybody can go into the DAO and submit a vote as they choose. Um, so we're just really trying to do this to, to give people a heads up and, and know when they would expect to maybe stake their tokens um, beforehand. Of course, we define our tokenomics. This has been a super uh, important thing for me to, to do as a founder, something that I never uh, necessarily knew how to do, um, but really important in our CIP, really important for our community to understand what we're doing with the tokens, where they're going, um, how many tokens that we're creating. Uh, we have a 10 million token soft cap. Um, it's a soft cap because PSCs, uh, profit sharing communities can always vote to have more tokens. Um, but we primarily wanna use these tokens to fund our operations, build our community, and you can kind of see some of the different buckets that we plan on, on, on using them for. I really encourage everyone to think long and hard about some of these allocations because it's hard to, to kind of reverse some of these decisions. Part of our token model is to uh, reward our users for, for being a part of the community and, and using our apps. So we identified three key reward areas. Um, and this is really in response to some of the things we did try to do and we, we didn't have positive results. Like for example, we tried a scheme on Twitter where you could kind of you know, tweet about our drive, you get some tokens and things like that. It's hard to be successful with because they could be abused really easily. So we wanted to incentivize three main things. One, referring people for our drive. Two, uploading quality content to our drive. And three, using our drive. Um, so unlike typical blockchain protocols that have their rewards kind of baked in, um, we have the luxury of being able to change it up over time, right? And adjust these mechanisms and adjust the amounts of tokens going out.
And then finally, we ended our community improvement proposal with some of the metrics that we are gonna look at to know we're successful. I think this is important for any community, business, app, you always have to know how well you're doing. Um, so these are some of the things that we're tracking, like for example, um, how many people are following us on social media, our community growth, our publications, um, our response time for getting back on um, user issues, problems, um, and some of the, the reports and some of the data gathering here isn't completed yet. Um, so, you know, there is a need there to, for example, understand how many replications of your file um, is on the Arweave network. So some things we actually have to work on to collect these metrics. Going through a document like the community improvement proposal definitely forces you to clarify a lot of things about your new community. Um, maybe you'll learn some things as you go through it. Maybe you'll realize you don't really have a community in the end, um, but I think it's a good exercise to do. On the flip side of all this community talk, we are working with some really um, incredible technology. So let's move on and talk about the protocol that we layer on top of our Weave to meet the needs of the R Drive applications. So our Weave doesn't come with a native way to manage your uploaded data like a file system. So we had an opportunity to innovate a bit when we first started our Drive. So the vision was that any application connected to the PermaWeb can interact with this protocol, giving users additional privacy options and share that same set of permanent data. And this could really eliminate a lot of the data silos and pockets that we see on the traditional web today. So we created this open and extendable protocol to support that vision. Uh, we call it ARFS or Arweave FS, um, and it's really an append-only transaction data model. Uh, we say it's append-only because you can't delete data on Arweave, you can only add to it. Um, and what it does is it allows the state of a file system or a drive to be constructed by any client or app that uses it. And it supports things like changing file versions, renaming, moving, custom metadata. Uh, it defines a, an encryption process to support true end-to-end -end privacy. And all the data that uses RFS can easily be queried by any application using Arweave and GraphQL. So let's get into a little bit more. Um, the data model is designed to be really flexible. Um, we use what we call entities to represent the different file system states. Each entity has a really specific schema um, with a unique UUID. Um, entity metadata is actually split across GraphQL tags and a JSON file. And the reason why we do that is because some of this metadata does get encrypted, like for example, the folder name. We really don't want to expose anything about this, uh, about your private information. Um, and then it's also important to note that files, you know, actual file data is separated between the data transaction and a metadata transaction. And this allows you to change the metadata about that file over time without having to re-upload the data itself. So we have three entity types now. Drives are the top level container of all of your files and folders, and they kind of act as that security boundary. And you create those with a single metadata transaction. Folders are a collection of files or subfolders, you know, pretty self-explanatory, also uh, uh, achieved by a single metadata transaction. And then files are actually a combination of the actual file data and the metadata about the file, like it's timestamp, file name, and anything else you would want to specify. And that metadata transaction points to the data transaction. I mentioned that there's a, a privacy model built into our we file system. Uh, we fully believe that if you don't hold the encryption keys to your data, then it's not fully private. So every file that uh, leverages the privacy option in our we file system uses a, a symmetric encryption algorithm um, and takes a combination of the user's our we wallet, a signature from their wallet, and what we call their drive password. So maybe let's walk through the encryption process a little bit, starting on the left. So first, we get a SHA-256 signature of a unique drive ID that we create using your Arweave wallet. You see here a little R-Connect uh, logo because luckily we we're able to integrate with them to support this type of wallet signature. We then take that uh, SHA-256 signature and use a hash-based uh, key derivation function to determine the drive key. And that's where we combine the drive password. We take that drive key and then we derive all the file keys using that same hash base key derivation function and each file's unique file ID. And that's what creates our encrypted buffer. So we then tag that and upload that to the PermaWeb. So you can see that your keys never leave your computer and the file never leaves your, your computer um, without being encrypted. 
So just to walk through kind of the data model um, and building a drive, uh, you know, the drive holds all of your files and folders. It could be public, it could be private. If it is private, there's a few more tags you have to add. Um, and the data JSON for a private file is also encrypted with that same AES-256 um, process that I uh, just walked through. Um, you can follow up with us at the booth. We have links to our Arweave file system. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details of each tag, um, but you can just kind of get a sense of, of how things are laid out. Um, you could also build a folder as well. Folders reference that drive ID and the parent uh, folder ID. If it's a root folder of a drive, there is no parent. So that's how you, you define that. And files, again, have a metadata transaction and a data transaction. The metadata <coughs> TX references the, the data TX to allow that additional flexibility. Um, you'll see that uh, both file data and file metadata have their own cipher and initialization vector. And again, this is to support uh, the privacy and the encryption of both the core file data and its metadata. It's important to point out that you can always add more GraphQL tags to this. You can also add additional tags to the, J to the data JSON as well. So if you connect all the dots and see how it all fits, in, fits together, uh, this is kind of a view of a private drive. Um, folders and files reference their parents and the underlying drive via those unique IDs. Um, and you can essentially end up with a drive where different applications are adding different kinds of files from different sources. And that could be public or private data. So I think that sounds pretty cool, and I think that's a real nice way to connect some of these applications across our Web3 community. Once the files have been tagged and submitted in mind, querying for them is really, really easy. Um, and that's because our Weave now has GraphQL. Um, so the benefit of using this real strict information architecture like RFS is that it makes it really straightforward to find your files later. Um, we have lots of code examples on GitHub you could check out. Um, but this is how you would um, create the state of a drive. You get all the drives for a user. You get their root folder. You get all the entities for that drive. And then you're just mapping the IDs to names. Um, for the private data, you pull the cipher initialization vector tag, and that's what you can then use to, to decrypt it. So again, we have lots of code examples um, you could reference to put this into your application. We're always looking to update RFS. Uh, it's on version 11, 0.11 now. We would like to uh, soon move that to 12. We're introducing some new things like hiding files, folders, and drives, maybe introducing an NFT entity using the Arweave Atomic Standard, uh, maybe integrating with uh, the squad social protocol, um, and a few other things. It's important to note that we're definitely looking for co-authors, right? This is not meant to be, you know, we're not calling this our drive FS. This is our Weave FS, and we wanted it to be uh, a collaboration between everyone in the Arweave ecosystem. So if you have thoughts and ideas around how this could be extended further, we'd love to hear about it. Um, I've definitely had my own tips and, and kind of lessons learned uh, as being a founder. You know, this is my first, you know, entrepreneurial experience. So, you know, some things maybe kind of common sense to others, um, or may not be common sense to others, but these are the things that really struck me. I already mentioned it, but tokenomics can definitely be hard if you're not familiar with it. It takes a lot of time um, and planning, so make sure you, you give it the time needed. Um, as a founder, I really think you have to, to go all in, right? If you're not putting in that effort, somebody else is. Um, you really need to also identify any of the one-way decisions. Someone on my team uh, keyed me into to this, and I think it's, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? A one-way decision is something that you can't really come back from once you decide it. Um, so if you identify a decision as being one way, then perhaps you look at the risk and rewards a little bit differently and really you know, weigh the pros and cons of, of, of making that decision. Um, creating profit sharing communities, really easy. You can click a few buttons, spend a little bit of AR, and get your own token. Um, it's not so easy to understand the legal and tax aspects of that. Absolutely recommend every founder to look into that um, as they're going through this process. Don't save it for the end because it does take time and uh, there's a lot to learn. Um, don't be afraid to experiment and fail. Um, we're working with really new tech, so some things might not work, um, but you got to try to see what sticks. Um, part of that is also being really flexible, right? You may not have the perfect situation starting up a new uh, project. So I think having flexibility with your team, the tools, the, you know, the technology you use is really important. Um, when you're designing an incentive mechanism, try to find a scammer hat to put on. 
right? Because there's always going to be somebody out there trying to game your token or get as much reward for as minimal effort as possible. So really try to put yourself in their shoes and see what could happen by, um, uh, by doing some kind of incentive mechanism. Um, it's always important, I think, to, to be yourself. Um, Unique people make unique things, right? We don't need more copies. Um, don't trust, but verify your resources. So, um, you know, a lesson learned for me was that it's easy to lose time and money on the wrong people, right? So just because somebody says they can do something or a resume looks nice, always important to get, you know, get referrals, see work, check out code, you know, do that due diligence to save yourself some hassle. Um, and then finally, um, important for every um, Rweave founder is to think permanently. What's your app or service going to be like in a year, five, 10, 20, 50 years, right? Because that's, you know, the lifespan of our weave. So you really have to think about the dependencies on your apps, you know, what it's using, who you're relying on, what other services, um, and yeah, try to, to think permanently. So with that, um, I did want to leave you all with an announcement of our next usage mining program called Dust. It's actually using the acetine algorithm that, that Tate just mentioned. Um, but we're rewarding up to 800 tokens per day for the next six months to all the top data loaders, uh, data uploaders. Um, first rewards going out tomorrow at 12 p.m. PM Eastern. So go to app.rdrive.io and start uploading now. And thank you, everyone. Uh, this is, you know, first to our conference. I've been looking forward to something like this for a really long time. So come to our booth to learn more about our drive and uh, check out our open roles for community manager and developer. And thanks again. Thanks, Phil. Really, really cool. Really interesting and great learnings there. Um, and next up, we will have uh, Fabian in Kive. And Fabian, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Seb. Uh, I'm just showing the screen. Oh, is it running? Yep. They, oh, whoa, there we go. <laughs> All right, first of all, guys, thanks for having me. Super excited uh, to be here. I kind of dedicated my, my phone talk today to a very uh, deep technical dive into into all the RV stuff. I do have some very technical um, and background and thought I give some new upcoming developers or so even developers of uh, of some RV apps, some some tips and tricks I learned uh, along the way, how, how they can improve their uh, yeah, their the composability in, in the RV ecosystem. Uh, so first of all, some some words about me. Uh, I started in the web two space at a at a local startup here called Wifflehead. It's the it's the uh, icon on the left you can see it's, it's an ad tech startup. I uh, was doing some full stack um, development there and then got into Arweave. Uh, I think it was some, around summer last year. Um, and with kind of the vision to build some kind of a permanent DocuSign um, solution, but then really quick noticed, all right, there's actually no, no way to tell that like an address is, is trustable, is, is verifiable, is a real human, or maybe it's a scammer, right? You just see the cryptic address and you don't really know what's going on. So I kind of dedicated my time after that to, to develop a Verify in October to, uh, to December also um, participated in the last hackathon and then things really started to kick off in February and March uh, from the Verify side and we're now slowly transitioning into a new project called Kaif. I'm also giving a small demo later on. Um, and and Kaif, we're really focusing on um, bridging other blockchains uh, like Polkadot, Solana, uh, those big layer ones onto, onto Huawei. So super excited for, for the next time um, coming up. So I'll verify is the is the blue tick uh, for the perma rep. As already said, there was like before that, right? There was no way to kind of say this address is trustworthy. This is not was really yeah missing some kind of a mechanism there. Um, there were some some giveaways from tokens. I think it was on the on the R drive uh, set where just people created fake addresses, um, signed up for um, for the for the airdrop, gained some tokens, all of that stuff, and. Yeah, so this is kind of how, how we came up with our Verify and it all started with Phil's tweet, uh, kind of soft releasing um, our Verify for us and things just uh, kicked off from then. I think you've seen the tweet by, by many times. We do have some, some great user traction and 5,570 verifications um, right now. And it's, it's just amazing what, um, what really happened. So first of all, some use cases. So how can you use our Verify in such an application to protect it from, from spammer or, or scammers? So first thing would be, you could have a verification-based login. You could say, all right, 
maybe um, you can only access the app when your users do have a sp specific or verify um, percentage score. Um, and another feature could be a verification-based feature. You could say, all right, the users can see everything, but for example, doing some trades or receiving something, uh, you need to have an, a verified score. And I think this was first seen um, in the Bones NFT, which was a big kickoff for, for Verify, built by, um, his Discord name is Ovotion. Um, and yeah, so this was like the real big use case for Verify, where he kind of said, all right, I'm just going to give away the NFT for anyone who has a higher than a 60% um, a Verify score. Um, so how can you secure your, your um, application with, with a Verify? It's actually super easy. It's just a single line of code. Uh, basically, you just get the user's address, and then you just call the get verification uh, function in our um, JavaScript library. And basically, that, that's all you do, right? You can just do an if check then and say, if the user is verified, please do this and that. And you can access uh, the percentage. You can see on which transaction he got verified, if he got verified with the Google sign method, which is a new feature we, we have released. And so, yeah, super easy to, to integrate for all of the developers to really, yeah, basically get the best out of your application, make sure you do have a verified user base. Um, a verified works with the so-called trust algorithm. Um, it's a modified page rank algorithm in the, the background and it's based on user interaction. So we kind of thought, okay, how can we measure trustworthiness in a system? And we, we kind of said, all right, someone who interacts with another address a lot must be verified because I'm not interacting a lot with addresses, especially not sending any, any uh, values, right, when I don't trust him. So this is why we kind of uh, yeah, use this feature. And then we also said, all right, you can verify other people to kind of give them a head start already. Um, and it was super crazy. And once the, the Bonds NFT launched, we even had a civil attack. Let me just turn my laser pointer here. I hope you guys can see it. But down here, this is all the scammer network. These are all fake addresses. And you can see it's just connected with this one single address who started the, the attack. I think the attack was probably March, um, made a huge uh, huge noise in our in our algorithm. But you can see it's it's super sustainable against those big civil attacks to really make sure that only verified addresses um, do get a higher verified score. And you can see those big um, or highly verified addresses right down here in the center, which, for example, the community XYZ wallet or the virtual trading post, right? Because a lot of different people interact with it. Um, and because so many people ask how the, the, the trust score is actually calculated in the, in the background, um, basically it works like this. If you have a high verification score and you interact with other people or uh, you verify other people, you basically give more of your score to other people, um, which really transport this forward. And um, yeah, I think there's like a good explanation on the left side how this works. So you can see B only interacts with C, but C does have a super high page rank or verification score in that example, just because B transposed so many over. Although like in cases, I think you can even see it here, where so many little addresses just verified a single address, but it wasn't like a huge impact um, in the score. Um, how does monetization work? So far we have made a profit, like the whole our profit sharing community made a profit of 550R. Uh, within four weeks, which is just eight weeks, sorry, which is uh, crazy, the, the amount of traction we got there. And 40% um, of the tip goes to the community, or even 100% if he's verified through his shareable link, which we saw in the tweet, um, Phil tweeted out. Um, but if the user verifies via Google, he receives 40% uh, receives the community, and 60% of the fee for verification goes to the host who operates the trading post. So this is how the community kind of can engage with hosting those trading courses, first of all, providing another layer of decentralization, um, but also, yeah, providing a, a secure method to do some sign-in. Um, because, yeah, for this Google sign-in, you do know the you do need the verify auth nodes, and they are also super easy to use in your application. So, if you want to verify users through your application, um, you can also just use the verify um, JavaScript library, just import the verify function. Um, set your own return URI from your application. So this could, for example, be R drive. Um, and then you just, you just call the verify function. You can even set your referral address, which would be, let's say, your address, for example. So you would be um, getting some, some tips and some verify tokens as well by using our service inside your application. So yeah, the user can verify without even needing to, to leave your site. Um, if you do have any questions about our verify, feel free to, to reach out to my Gmail or uh, join our Discord or something. And while working on our Verify, now switching over to Kive, um, we've been working with SmartWeave a lot. And um, in SmartWeave, we do have the, the problem that they are all in JavaScript right now, and there wasn't a way to write um, SmartWeave in, in JavaScript. So we kind of came up with a way to write uh, SmartWeave in TypeScript and made it modelizable, composable. Because the, the problem is every 
a smart weave contract which wanted to use Virto, for example, needed to have this simple transfer function, but everyone had to copy it from another contract or get it from anywhere. So we kind of thought, okay, how can we kind of modularize it? Um, and we came up with the system um, to have those models. You can see a lock module there, which basically takes in the state interface, an action interface, and then you can do all the fancy stuff in there. And then you can just import it in your contract. Um, the library is very new. It's called Smart with Modules. You can find it in GitHub on uh, github.com slash smart with slash modules. Um, and you can see you just have your normal handle functions you would have it in your uh, smart weave contract. But then inside here, you do have the um, the transfer function. You just import the module, basically, you import from the module library. So we really work on composability and also right, enhancing open source collaboration so other people can really work on this and, and make the best. And the Virto team, for example, can publish the transfer function and other people can just use it without the needing to copy pasting it or coming up with their own logic. So hopefully this will have a lot of people um, building better uh, smart with contracts. Um, when, when also, if you want to compile and deploy, by the way, your uh, TypeScript written smart with contracts, also check out the smart with modules um, library. There is an explanation for building and, and deploying this. Um, and once you've deployed your smart weave contract, you of course want to test it. <laughs> and before having the testing library, it was it was a pain, right? You deployed it, you, especially when doing multi interactions, you have to do multiple interactions, wait for five minutes, ten minutes, and just to see an error coming up. So we kind of came up with the way to to test your smart weave contracts, which is by writing a, a testing interface, um, where you basically yeah just spin up a new instance of the smart weave tester. You import your handle function from your from your contract, which you're uh, exporting here. And then basically you can just execute um, execute any action against it and without needing to have it deployed to our weave. So we all have it locally. It's super fast and you can do unit tests around it. In our case, in Kaif, it basically looks like this. We do have some written um, tests for it. So let's say locking tokens or unlocking tokens, right? So it raises an error when a caller is registered in a pool. Then we do have this uh, function, this input where we say unlock the, for the pool ID and then we just uh, execute the, the smart weave testing thing, and then we can see if any errors occurred or something, which just yeah makes smart weave writing and all of that stuff a lot better and a lot easier for us. Um, as already said, you can find all the information on that on, on our GitHub, um, and happy to get any open source collaboration and uh, really yeah, work more on this. Then a lot of other useful tools we are using on our side to to make development much easier is RDB written by by Cedric. Um, RDB really makes it it's super easy for you to interact with the R uh, with GraphQL endpoint without needing to know any GraphQL code. It's really simple forward. I just 100% recommend you on checking that out. RGQL written by by John, um, also super easy. It requires a little more knowledge about the GraphQL endpoint, but yeah, I just to say development is so much easier. Limestone, if you need to fetch any pricing data, check out Limestone. It has all of the pricing decentralized stored on, on our weave. And also R Connect. I think Martin is giving a call uh, soon after soon after this um, presentation about this, and he will definitely give you some more details um, about it. Well, then, guys, happy hacking. I uh, hope my tips uh, helped you a lot, and you can yeah, just play around with all of the TypeScript stuff and all of this. Um, feel free to reach me out on Discord if you do have any questions or Twitter um, or GitHub. And yeah, thanks for having me. I tried to keep it short, but very developer focused. Thanks. Amazing. Thanks so much for that, Fabian. That's really cool. And and the the um, testing tools you guys have been building for SmartWeek are super, super valuable. So I think we'll see a lot more uh, usage in the future as well. Yeah, all of that stuff you've been building is just amazing tooling uh, for other people in the ecosystem to get on board with. So thanks again for that. OK, so up you. next, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, Argo with Prashant. Um, interesting choice of avatar there, Prashant. <laughs> yeah. Hey Sam. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. Thank you for uh, onboarding me here. Let me just share my screen. So yeah, uh, I am Prashant. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm here to represent Argo, uh, decentralized, secure, and permanent deployment platform. Uh, we have been we have been building Argo for a longer time, and and we we came at a stage where it's time for us to scale and grow in different different aspects and that is what i'm going to talk about entirely and in the entire talk you won't find anywhere the technicalities because i i'm a guy who just prefer to keep technicalities in the in, in different different platforms but here i'd like to cover more of what exactly we have learned 
uh, what exactly uh, what are the what are the trade offs which we had and all those, but but not more on a technical side. So let me talk about myself. Uh, I'm a founder of Argo, one of the founder of Argo. Mitrashis is also the second one. Uh, I have around six years of enterprise application development. Uh, I've been with the enterprise application development for a very longer time. I learned many things from there. I learned, uh, and, and those are the things which is helping me now to shape the Argo in a very different way. And what 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 are the ways I, I always think thought of. Uh, coming to our vision. Uh, so when we started Argo, I had a vision. We had a vision to go ahead and build something. And the vision was, simplicity at the heart which means we wanted to keep things pretty simple uh, because i am a guy who believe in onboarding more user on the application i'm a guy who believe in if the same things are very simple people are going to love it and they are going to use it and that is where argo born and and, and that is how exactly we are going to carry forward argo in a longer run going going down the line three to four years five or down the line whatever the years we have and then we always make sure this is the reason we always follow uh, before getting started with the entire presentation, I have a very little promo video, which basically talks about Argo and also how are we supporting us in building the future. Uh, let me know if you guys see it. Thank you. Yeah. Although the internet is one of humanity's greatest innovations, its full potential is capped by the control of governments, corporations, and other institutions. This contributes to a host of problems for the average user, including monthly subscription fees, deplatforming, and broken links. It's time for a decentralized web hosting solution that provides users with more privacy, better security, and lower costs across the board. Introducing Argo, Argo is a blockchain-based serverless app deployment platform that takes your web app to a decentralized hosting service. Following a simple deployment process, developers can securely launch web apps, store and retrieve assets, host websites, and gain HTTPS on every deployment, thanks to the RV protocol. The platform requires only a single one-time fee and provides 100% uptime, eliminating the annoyance of hidden fees or reoccurring web archival hosts. With immutable data, custom domain configuration, and a censorship-resistant platform, users benefit from complete freedom and control of their content. Argo is creating a decentralized solution that bridges the gap between Web 2.0 and Web 3.0 developers, so users can enjoy a more transparent and intuitive experience. No more 404 errors, no more censorship, no reoccurring fees. The future of web development is here. Join Argo today. Awesome. Uh, so I hope that video covers most of the things what Argo does and how exactly uh, we are planning to grow in a, in a wider aspects. Uh, now let's 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 come on a point where uh, I'll talk about what we are currently building and what are the things which are in the pipeline. So and what what we are currently building is we are we are we want to become infrastructure on that, which means our our entire solution is gonna be built around onboarding more users, onboarding enterprise users, and onboarding people who are coming on the web application. For example, DEXs are our best use cases where they can go ahead and they can use start taking the backup of their web applications. Even a recent most use case was the Uniswap when their web application was down and people were like afraid how exactly they are going to access it. And the best use case was they should have taken the backup on, on, on us and then their user might not have faced the problem. So that is what, as an Argo, which we are currently working on and we are, we are building around the RV. And now coming to the developers and the people who want to in the, in the RV ecosystem, where do you want to put us in? Uh, and, and where do we lie in, the, in your development process? We are, we are also open for any of the collaboration and happy to help in, in onboarding as well. But yes, coming to this part where exactly we lie in your product development lifecycle, it is on the, your development side. We are also working on the storage mechanism where you can start using our Argo for storing your assets, web application assets, and in the caching mechanism and all those. And we also support a custom domain configuration. And, and recently, we also launched our runtime domain name resolver service that, that, that you guys can start using it. Uh, coming to what new coming on the Argo side. What are the things which we are currently working on and how exactly we are going to achieve those? Uh, 
the first thing which we are currently working on is the caching mechanism. We want to improve the cache. We want to improve the uh, uh, the uh, speed the, of the application. We we we, we did some uh, POCs. We we got successful, and most probably we're launching it soon on the caching part. Uh, now coming to decentralized deployment deploy node, we are working on. So currently we support a deploy node from our side. It's, it's a private one, but now we are also working on to make it more of a public, where any of the community member can go ahead and use that deploy node for deploying the application, and they can start earning Argo tokens. Uh, now coming to this, the third one, which is very important, and I believe this is gonna attract more of a user on on our ecosystem altogether, and that is called storage connectors. Uh, which means you can use Argo storage connector to connect your any of the database. It takes the snapshot, it puts pulls it down and can send it to the RV altogether for long-term archival. And that is gonna be useful for the big enterprises who are going to store the data for let's say 10 years, 20 years down the line, right? So those are the people who will be targeting and who will be using all these uh, storage connectors. Coming to uh, what we have learned uh, during our journey with RV. So we started our journey with RV fellowship. And uh, it was a nine months back, I believe, October, uh, around September, and and that that was the time when we started taking the lesson, lessons from uh, from Sebastian. I was we were taking the lessons from Sam, and we learned a lot during down the line. And there were a couple of points which we noted down, and and we thought like I should share with you guys, with you guys as well because you guys are also building applications around it, and you guys should know this. So the first thing I always emphasize is building product is easier than selling it, which means if you are a good dev, you know product, you know technology, you can come on the RB, you can build anything. Literally, you can go ahead and do whatever you want to. But when it comes on selling the product, that is where your success is going to be defined. And that is what you have to start focusing on the day you launch your MVP, the day you launch your POC, and that is what I believe Sebastian and everyone might have already talked and, and, and explained mo most of the things about like how exactly you are going to go to the market. And those are the points which you have to take care of very seriously and start taking off, taking care of if you have not started. Second thing is most of founders have already talked about community is very important. Uh, and I also believe the same because uh, community members has helped us initially to build even our first of the first UI when it was revamped, it was been designed by one of the community member. Uh, next year solution, which we support now, it is also been given by one of the community members. Uh, we always go and see the community for the feedbacks. They are all there for the feedbacks. It's like community is like a family, right? Uh, it is your family. And then RVB is a bigger family than that for what you have. So make sure you involve your community in whatever things you are doing. And that is very important. Third thing which I want to focus on is be open for collaboration. What I mean with this is you should be open to go and talk to the people. You should be open to collaborate with the project. You should be open to go and talk to the founders of other, other projects who are already being, building cool stuff into the ecosystem. And that is where you are going to learn a lot. So for me, take an example. I have I have been talking with Phil. I have been talking with Ted. I have been talking most of the founders in the ecosystem space for a longer time. and and believe me, you will the moment the day you will start talking, the the that is the day when you will start learning more and more. And I have learned a lot. I have had the zero knowledge and now I have at least a knowledge where I can go and talk about RB, I talk about Argo. So make sure you are open for the collaboration. Uh now this is the bigger question. And this is kind of a question which I sh I should be very cautious about answering, but I am very bullish on what we are building. And we where we see Argo and RB is the sky is the limit, which means going down the line, what our project and the ecosystem, what are the product is gonna build, the network effect which we are going to get is gonna be huge. And uh, frankly speaking, on the RV side, the team is awesome. You the entire team is awesome, the entire ecosystem is awesome, and that is where I have the gut to say the sky is the limit. And at Argo, we are also believing the same thing. We are also working towards the same goal. And that is the reason we together have a very longer goal and target to, to achieve. Uh, so thank you very much for, for, for listening to me. And uh, this is our Discord channel uh, mail ID. And, and just, just, just drop us a message anywhere if you guys have any questions. Love to answer those. Thank you very much.
Amazing. Amazing. Thanks so much. Uh, let me just check. Uh, can you see me? Hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So next up is Martin with uh, R Connect. Here we go. Thanks, Prashant. That was awesome. So, so hey, Martin. Hey, um, I'm going to talk about R Connect. Um, let me share my screen quickly. So I hope everyone can see this. Um, so yep. today I'm going to talk about our connect. So first, first off, um, um, I'm going to uh, tell you a few things about myself. So my name is Martin Lederer. Uh, and I am the main developer behind our connect. Um, I'm also part of the uh, virtual team. Um, uh, so yes, I am a student. I'm 17 years old. I've been in development since since uh, 12, since I've been 12. Um, and yep, uh, uh, RVV, I'm really new to, I'm still new to RVV, but I love it. And I'm starting to really understand how it works. So um, um, today I'm going to talk about our Connect's uh, achievements, um, our published features, and as well as upcoming uh, ones. And I'm also going to explain what our Connect is for, for anyone who doesn't know about this exciting project. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start right with the or EV ecosystems uh, big problem, um, the the upload your key file mechanism. Um, so as we know, the apps on the on our EV need your key file in order to interact with the network. Um, because of this, um, they require you to require you to uh, upload your key file. Not necessarily upload. Uh, you just provide with your key file, your wallet key file, so they can create uh, transactions, smart EV contracts, etc. And obviously, most of the perma apps on RV are not malicious and uh, will probably not steal your key file. Um, however, sh sharing a private key file, a private key is essential. Not sharing a private key is, is essential nonetheless. Um, so how can we allow decentralized apps to, to seamlessly interact with the network while not exposing our key file that might have our life savings on it? So we present to you R Connect, um, and R Connect is a browser extension that allows uh, a secure flow of transactions or data between the network and, and the decentralized application, and of course the user's wallet. And so R Connect is basically a, a middleware. It provides a middleware that can be implemented by developers into their application. Uh, the transaction signing happens in a secure environment by the extension. Uh, so that the apps don't have to ask for the user's key file. Um, and also, uh, wallet key files are safely encrypted in the browser's local storage, so it doesn't get published in, on, on the web, um, no matter what you do. Um, and the reason why this is, is even better is that R Connect is built so that users can enjoy a Web 2 experience and a Web 3 experience in one. So you can log in with uh, with your password and allow permissions, and you know you can be safe um, with all this mechanism. So um, so R Connect is not just a signing client. Uh, uh, while R Connect is a powerful signing client, of course, um, this is nowhere near to its full potential. So R Connect is uh, is the map for the perma, basically, as I'd like to say. Um, so we are going to release a Firefox, Firefox version for R Connect 2, but right now we only support Chrome. Um, but, but obviously we will try to release for all mainstream browsers so that the users of all, all these major browser platforms will be able to, to tap into the secure perma web. And, and obviously, um, as I said, um, R Connect is the map to the perma web, um, and uh, because of this, new features are published weekly. 
um, and we have a tight schedule and we work on coming up with, with more and more useful uh, updates. And even now with, with R Connect, you can manage your wallets, um, see your balances, your PSTs, your assets, uh, set spending limits for applications, um, disable specific permissions for applications in case you don't want them to, to maybe create transactions. You know, you just want to allow them to, to maybe see your address. Um, um, you can also see what actions and uh, application executed to our connect and if they are connected to our connect uh, so you can check back basically the event log of our connect everything's logged that that uh, every interaction with your with your uh, wallet is logged so you can later see that um, you can see your or verify verification score you can transfer ar and psts and you can also view information about psts um, and in the upcoming weeks, R Connect will also support uh, swapping through PSTs, dialecting the extension using Virto, and of course, archiving any website or PDF uh, document on our drive directly. So, so the R Connect API. Um, signing transactions with the R Connect uh, API does not need any kind of third party library or, or a complicated setup. Because the core functionality of this extension signing is built in, uh, in directly into RVGS, and uh, thanks to John John Letty, um, and this makes integration seamless and effortless from the developer's side. Um, and R Connect provides a much more feature-rich API for developers in case they want to, in case they want extended functionality for the application for their applications. They can request additional permissions. They can define custom names and icons for their apps. They can get currently selected wallet, the currently selected wallets address um, or the added wallets addresses. Um, they can access the wallet nicknames or labels that the user sets in the extension. Um, and they can decrypt and encrypt data. Um, and, and this can replace previous encryptions and decryptions with the user's key file. And this is going to be integrated in many, many um, um, permaweb applications uh, soon. Um, and in the future, they will be able, uh, they will even be able to test their application using sandboxing, which is really useful. So why should you implement, uh, why should the apps implement our connect? Um, and why should you implement it as a developer? <laughs> well, why wouldn't you? Um, our Connect provides a more seamless and secure experience. Um, if you want your users to trust you, this is the final step you need to show, you need to do, uh, because you need to show the world how secure your application is. Um, for example, Rverify and some other uh, the apps already fully support our Connect, uh, and soon even more mainstream and popular application we use it as well. Uh, so I really encourage you. Uh, and all applications to look into our connect and integrate it. Um, and also, as I mentioned previously in another presentation, we are also offering uh, two uh, two thousand word tokens to each profit sharing tokens and profit sharing token community that implements it, um, so they can join the secure perma web as well. So, um, if you have any ideas. Uh, on how sh should we continue um, our journey. If you want uh, to share something with us, or you just want a new feature to be added, um, please join our Discord or, or start contributing to our Connect. It, it is 100% open source. Um, and I think I'm going to show you a quick demo of our Connect. Um, I'm going to switch my screen. So, as I said earlier, Rverify already has um, already has R Connect integrated. Um, so I'm just going to refresh, and I'm just going to show how it works with with their awesome service. So basically, you just press Connect. It will just load the authentication window. You just type your password in, and you can log in. 
you can accept the permissions or you can you know disable one if you don't want to uh, allow it to the website you accept and here you go you are you log you're logged in um so yeah that, that this this would be all and thank you for your attention amazing thanks so much uh that's really cool i, I we we were thinking for a long time about what a uh, web extension you know offering this kind of functionality would look like for Arweave, and the one thing we didn't want to get into was uh, you know how web J web three js is not actually that user friendly or developer friendly like it's it's quite hard to get get on with and so we expected that the developer experience would unfortunately actually get worse when we had this kind of metamask like capabilities for Arweave. yet somehow the way you've built R connect is actually even easier than using the you know the um, uh, the key file management method is really impressive. You you literally just go along and you say, hey, create transaction and then dot sign, and it works. It's really amazing. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for your work there. I'm really Thank excited you. to see where it goes um, in the future. I think that basically we will eventually retire the old web extension and just install R Connect, you know, after audits and all the rest of it. But like, that's the principle. Very amazing. Cool. Um, yeah, OK. So Al, I think, from Koi is with us next. Um, hey, Al. Oops. You I'm here. On the stage okay. and then you let it come to the oh. podium here. Right? Christian, maybe you could, uh, you could wheel yourself uh, off the stage if that's all right for taking one of the podium spots here. Anyway, in the meantime, Al, please take it away and tell us about Koi. Sure thing. Um, so. In order to kind of explain where Koi is coming from, I want to do a little bit of background about how we got into this and why are we so awesome? Because um, sometimes I think we miss some of this stuff as we're getting into it. A uh, little disclaimer before we dive in, I'm going to make some bad analogies and metaphors and gloss some stuff over, but uh, happy to discuss stuff after the fact if anybody has any questions. I'm on the Discord, uh, also on Twitter pretty actively, pretty happy to chat. Um, so to start off with, I'd love to talk a little bit about what blockchain is, um, because I think this kind of explains why our web is so significant. And some people seem to miss this when they first come into the ecosystem. Um, with a blockchain, typically you have permanent storage, and then you have consensus as to what goes into that storage. And this is really, really cool, because um, this just allows you to have this giant permanent thing that people can add to. Um, and this was groundbreaking with Bitcoin, Ethereum, kind of remixed that a little bit. Um, and now we've seen a lot of people doing different stuff. Before we continue, though, um, I'm going to have like several of these slides, and they're basically definition slides. So we've got our subject, blockchain here, permanent storage, and social consensus. Uh, I'm going to try to not be too pedantic as I go through these, though. Um, so I mentioned that Ethereum kind of remixed this concept. Ethereum took the Bitcoin idea of a blockchain, and they said, OK, it's a state transition. So you take the first state, and then you go through, and you get to the second state. Um, and this is a huge innovation because it changed around how people actually did blockchain a lot. Uh, you know, our friend Vitalik here gave everybody a lot of Lambos by changing the game. The, the funny thing, though, is the smart contract thing that he invented um, actually had a lot of other applications. And as we know, working with SmartWeave, you can do really, really interesting things with it. Um, so the thing that's happened with SmartWeave is that basically now we have just literally any code and then a bunch of signatures and storage. And that's pretty much a smart contract. You just have all this information, you keep storing it over and over again, and you can put it into there, uh, which is really neat. Um, and so this is also kind of how NFTs work, right? Um, and as the team at Virto have shown, there's some really amazing things that can be done with these on our weave as well. Um, similarly with NFTs, especially on our weave, you're storing a media file with a signature, which is uh, kind of awesome, because on all the other blockchains that try to do this, they actually just they store the file somewhere else, and then they have the signature stored on another platform. Um, so what we're thinking with Koi is that there's sort of an opportunity to take the internet as we currently see it, uh, break it all up into little pieces, sign those pieces and give them ownership, and possibly put them all up into our uh, So that's kind of what we've been thinking about with Koi. The, the funny thing about this though, and a lot of people have been looking at this problem, is that storing things into a permanent medium can be tricky. Um, so in the slide about Ethereum, I mentioned the state transition concept. And so this is this idea of chains of blocks. And you can only add one block at a time to the chain. Um, the really cool thing about Arweave, though, is that with Arweave, you can dump pretty huge amounts of data into Arweave. And sometimes it doesn't even really need to go through the consensus process immediately. 
Um, so with Koi, what we're playing with is trying to um, tweak that system. And we, we started out trying to do this to kind of do web scraping. Uh, then we realized we could use it for attention tracking. Um, but now we've realized that kind of our weave could be the basis of a whole bunch of applications in the future. Uh, just an absolutely wild amount of stuff that you can do with it. And yeah, so our weave is really awesome. Um, thanks, Sam. As a slight digression, I'm not just showing the GIF of Sam here. If we click on this, we get an Arweave NFT. And some of you guys might already be familiar with these, but this is really neat because it's an image file, but it's also a smart contract. And so it's a smart contract with an image file inside of it. And that's just, that's incredible because that's like a new file type. That's like a new kind of like a JPEG or a PNG or something. Now we've got smart contracts that contain data. Um, and you got your signature here, right? So this is actually basically, um, it's, it's like a decentralized data store that controls little pieces of information, all kinds of places all over the world. And it's owned by somebody. So like right here, I think it's probably Tate or John, somebody from the Berto team. And it's owned. And it's got ownership. It's got properties. You go to contract. You've got the ability to transfer this to people. Um, you know, you've got some functions that are built into it. You've got your state. And this means that this little payload of data now has a life of its own. And it's going to continue existing, even if the original owner stops using it or stops looking at it. Um, the really cool thing, especially with what we're doing at Koi, is that if you own one of these NFTs and other people will look at it, then we can give you Koi tokens for that because we can track that something happened to that NFT at some point. Um, the other really cool thing about this is the cost. So I don't know if you guys have looked at the R-Wave price recently, but like this is pretty cheap. It's like two pennies to be able to publish an image onto the permaweb forever. Um, and so that, like, from an economics perspective, is just way, way better than anything we've been doing before. So here's a few slides. I wasn't sure if that link was going to work, so we have all these in here. Um, but this really means a lot of really cool things can be done on top of our weave because it's incredibly composable. And you've got these functionalities that are just built into your data set. Uh, so kind of playing with this a little bit with Koi, but generally speaking, proof of access is kind of a miracle. Um, and it's going to completely change the game for most of the blockchain applications that are out there because now we're storing the data and we don't necessarily have to always find consensus as to what the data means right away. We can do that after the fact as long as we can store all of it. Um, so here's some great images I found on Google Images about proof of access. Uh, generally speaking, this concept of recall block, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is pretty amazing. Kind of uh, it uh, sort of disconnects the requirement to store things and makes it sort of an open competition to make sure that everybody's storing as much of the information as possible. Um, makes a huge difference. So the future of blockchain or the future of block weave is the real question. Personally, I think the block weave is coming along quite well. Um, so anyways, a little bit about Koi. Where we started out with Koi, um, we were looking at this concept of kind of tag databases that map the internet. So we were looking at kind of how Google operates and how large, large data companies create the indexes that they use. And the thing that we noticed is, well, you know, tags are everything, right? Um, and people in the last couple of presentations have talked about GraphQL and why that's so important. But, you know, if you look at Google's information system that they've created and their IP, the most valuable IP that they have is their tag database. Um, so we started out with Koi trying to create something similar. We wanted to go and scrape a lot of websites because if you scrape enough websites, then you can create your own tag database. Um, and so we worked on a way to standardize things to kind of like boil down a website like this into uh, you know, a more structured data payload that you can use for all kinds of other applications that is gonna be standardized across different websites that could be in an open place. Um, so we started out looking at this problem and that kind of took us down this rabbit hole of trying to get nodes to do very interesting things. Um, we brought it over to, uh, to Sam to ask if he would give us some, uh, some free storage. And he was really supportive of uh, looking at other applications as well. So something we realized with this is that, you know, we don't just have to go and scrape websites with this. We can get the same node that's scraping a website to go and hit a uh, traffic gateway and request some logs from it. Um, so we can do some other really interesting things. And this has kind of led us to this point now where we're looking at uh, Koi as a way to provide kind of backend services for some dApps. 
So things like web scraping can be done. Uh, things like attention tracking come with it out of the box. So we've got that pretty much up and running at the moment. Uh, but the gist of it is if you wanted to build a decentralized application on top of the R-Weave, um, we can help you to use our nodes, which have caching for the smart weave contracts, which have uh, attention tracking out of the box, and help you to create your own tokens that run on top of our weave so that you can build really cool applications without having to do all the heavy lifting. Um, similarly to what our connect is doing to try and make it easier for people to use uh, kind of browser extensions to use their public keys and private keys, we are also hoping that we can build a kind of framework of components so that it's really easy for you to build apps that can interact with you know, are we specifically, but also just with nodes that might need to do different things, um, possibly something with Kai, that kind of thing, uh, to make it really easy for you to build these permaweb apps. Because really the way that we see it is all of this information should be on the permaweb. There's really no reason for it not to be. Um, there's a ton of stuff out there and it'd be great if we could start to record these things, uh, you know, for posterity, but also for uh, cross-referencing and permanence and just to make sure that things don't get taken down over time. Quick note on the proofs of real traffic. Um, it sounds a little bit weird to be able to track attention and people think, wow, you could really easily spam that, that kind of thing. Uh, so what we're working on here is having our nodes actually record the, uh, the traffic that's coming through them. And so we've written a little bit of middleware that goes onto the Amplify gateways and it allows content viewers to submit these proofs. And it's an optional thing that they can opt into. But if you submit these proofs, which require a little bit of hashing, a little bit of uh, kind of signing with your private key, once you submit a proof like this, though, you've you've actually proven that you've been to a certain page and that you've uh, invested in it with your time and your energy. And this can be stored into Arweave. And so when we store these into Arweave, the coin nodes can come along and vote on them. And so every 24 hours, what we do is we go through all these traffic logs. We look at whose traffic got the most uh, views over that period. And then we assign our thousand koi tokens every day. And so we're creating these tokens from thin air. But if you want to access them, you actually have to register content to the coin network. So it creates kind of an interesting economic cycle where people are incentivized to burn Koi tokens so they can access future Koi tokens. But in the process, we, uh, we create a framework that allows us to reward the content creators themselves without necessarily having a, you know, an intermediary, like an advertiser or something like that, to actually pay them. Uh, so there's lots more on this. If you have questions about it, we're uh, really excited to talk through how this can work. And I think there's a lot of applications on our route that could benefit from it substantially. Um, to give you an idea of kind of how we see our weave going, and by no means is this the Koi stack here. This is kind of just a generalized roadmap that we're hoping to help kind of bring into light. Um, most of our weave will probably be involved in a very similar pursuit. So the way that we see this happening at the moment, we've been building a lot of kind of uh, client side frameworks to make it really easy for our Koi rocks portal to operate. But that combined with the uh, kind of web scraping and services infrastructure that we're building with Coin Nodes should allow us to provide a pretty simple framework for people to use. And you know, by no means does this have to be a Coin framework. If you've got something on Arweave that is useful, like um, Phil's R Drive, for example, would be a really great application here. We'd love to try and incorporate it because that will allow us to make it really easy for other people to come into the ecosystem and build apps on top of the Arweave. Uh, the easier it is that we the easier it is for people who are coming in to start to build new applications, the faster the ecosystem will grow. And we'll be bringing in more and more customers because people can come in and quickly package all these things together and build an application. Um, and I think that's really where this kind of goes in the long term. I think uh, our Verify probably is ahead of the game here because as all of these you know, permaweb apps get built, what we're going to see is that we're going to have a reputation kind of graph that allows us to say, this piece of content came from this person. This other person viewed it. And if you know if the second person there has a really strong reputation, then we can say, well, that piece of content by having been viewed by a bunch of people with strong reputations, is actually probably a pretty strong piece of content. And that's how we kind of get to this future that doesn't have Google having the only map of the internet. It's a system where we have an open map of the internet that everybody can access. And if we do that successfully, then we don't actually have to have um, we don't have to have a private version of it anywhere. We can just keep it all out in the open. And if we can build incentives on top of that, like the Koi token and others that have presented here today, we have the potential to uh, to build something that can basically continue to exist in perpetuity. But, you know, private organizations tend to fail eventually. Uh, that's why empires collapse. They tend to be rent seeking. And, uh, they suck a lot of profit out where they shouldn't. But what we have the potential to do here is to build something that can sustain itself 
it's an open door that anybody can come and build on top of. It makes it really easy for other people to um, provide value for each other and kind of enrich the ecosystem as it grows. So the purpose of the Koi token is that we create a thousand of them every day and we give them out to the people who are publishing content into the network. But you know, when we say the network here, we mean the Arweave permaweb in general. So if you have anything on Arweave that's going to be generating a lot of attention, we'd love to have you register with Koi. The cool thing is that if you register that content, uh, you can also come and use Koi notes for things. So we're working on making it really easy to cache SmartWave contracts, uh, also working on kind of like a buffer functionality so that you can write images um, and like kind of have multiple SmartWave contract uh, interactions happen uh, in sequence so that you don't have to wait for them each to go through. And you know, then you can also come along if you wanted to run a coin node or run some kind of a service and earn some of these tokens as well. So the idea here is to kind of create a virtuous cycle that results in more content getting added to the Arweave and actually to reward the content that is the best that the most people are looking at. Uh, so it kind of goes in two directions there. We, uh, we just closed a pre-sale round. We're trying to raise a little bit more money, but uh, we're aiming for a public sale a little later this year. And for us is use Arweave because, you know, we can launch a token anytime. Uh, it's not the most important part. Really the reason network because we really think that it'll allow our weave and the permaweb to exist well beyond any of our lifetimes thanks for uh, taking the time to listen thanks al I, I think we we lost you for a tiny second at the end um but i think everyone got the broad picture that was an amazing uh oh, thanks so much right all on. right Cheers. uh so next up yeah, cedric and i are going to discuss a little bit about uh community xyz uh, where profit sharing uh, communities began and, and where they're going next. Um, so, Cedric, hey, thanks for joining me. Oh, I cannot hear you, Cedric. Can uh, you hear me now? There we go. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, hey, Sam. Hey, everyone. Hey. So, for those in the community, I imagine it's not very many, but for those that don't know what uh, Community XYZ is, maybe you could give us a little bit of an overview. Uh, yeah, for sure. So Community XYZ is the, the dashboard and a platform where you can easily go and keep track of your own community. You can create your own community from there. And you can also go and see other communities to know what they are doing, what they are uh, working on, uh, all the votes that are happening. Uh, so all the governance uh, that is happening on that community. So pretty much everything that you can manage inside a, a profit sharing community, you are able to do it uh, by going into community XYZ. And we also uh, created a, a JavaScript library. So you can easily also interact with your community uh, from your own, uh, let's say, admin platform or dashboard that you have created uh, somewhere else. Uh, and with that, we also have uh, opportunities, which is, uh, another idea that we we came up with uh, to allow communities to create opportunities, create little uh, job, little tasks uh, for people to uh, participate in them. And then they get rewarded on uh, the same uh, tokens of your uh, profit sharing community that you have created. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was muted for a second. OK, <laughs> yeah, so so that's amazing. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about, um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Community XYZ was the first profit sharing community in existence itself, a profit sharing community run by a Community XYZ, so on, self bootstrapping. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you've been working on recently and, and where things are going. Uh, yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, it was Community XYZ was the first community created on top of community XYZ. So yeah, we are also uh, decentralized, fully decentralized, because even if community.xyz uh, goes down, there's a permaweb version that exists. And uh, yeah, we have a caching system uh, that allows it to load uh, faster by going into community.xyz. But even without the caching system, it all works. Uh, so yeah, it's fully decentralized, and it's also open source. So anyone can go ahead on GitHub and check out the source code. Um, 
And yeah, lately uh, with the NFT boom that started happening pretty much everywhere and even inside of Arwick, Arwick which uh, I'm really, really happy that it started uh, finally because since the very beginning, I was like, I don't get why people don't host their NFTs on right. top of Arwick. <laughs> yeah. Since uh, all of that could uh, easily disappear, let's say, from the uh, web 2.0 and from another server. So yeah, I'm really happy that that started. And with that, it came the Atomic NFTs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and yeah, so with the Atomic NFTs, people are able now to create a community, which is also an NFT. So it's an NFT that holds a, an entire profit sharing community uh, behind it. Yeah. Uh, and the first person that tried this out is uh, Kevin Abash mm -hmm. with his 1111 tokens. So each single of one of those NFTs, it's also a profit sharing community uh, behind it. Uh, so yeah, what I'm working on mostly right now is I want to uh, allow people to easily create communities, uh, create NFTs that are a community at the same time. Hmm. So Interesting. Uh, pretty much the same thing as the uh, page where you go and you create a community. Now you will be able to uh, deploy some content, let's say uh, an audio, an image, something else. And at the same time, it will be a profit sharing community behind it. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I just noticed that uh, Nicholas in the chat says that he's also working with someone um, on an NFT app as well, which reminds me of Evermore who are doing this. Uh, Verto have, have their own um, profit sharing token stroke NFT. Uh, I guess it's, it's really a, a wrapper for the underlying Verto protocol, that one. Um, but on top of that, there's also Koi.rocks that is doing this. So it's amazing to see that there are all of these clients for NFT related um, did you say activity being built on top of the system and I think yeah. in almost every case interoperable which is really cool to see um yeah yeah something that people often uh, forget is that uh, what you build on top of our it's accessible by pretty much anyone else that yeah. builds a project on top of it so yeah if for example you have a community you can interact with it even without using our library our javascript library mm -hmm. by just using the rweave api right so yeah i think that uh, right now maybe uh, we aren't all aligned on the uh, the standards let's say mm -hmm. for each nft that is created but yeah i think we will get uh, to a point that all of these projects will interact with each other to create an NFT that works with something else at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Like there's, there's going to be a process of, um, what do you say, uh, consensus, like fuzzy social consensus that happens around the standards, which we're already well yeah. into that. Um, and yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and right now, for example, at least for me, all of this is just testing things out, and I'm pretty sure. Most of us are just playing, testing pretty much all of this uh, yeah. at the same time. So it's hard to get with a standard right away, mm -hmm. but at least we get used to how it works and then we can uh, right. work together. Right. In so. and, and I think the interesting thing here is all about protocol composability, which I know like, I, I go on about all the time. <laughs> but, yeah. but I really think that it is the thing that will make the, the Perm Web stand out above Web 2 over like the short to medium term is that as soon as you get a few of these applications in the space, the amount of things you can do with your other applications multiplies. And, and yeah. that means we get this exponential growth in the number of things you can easily build on top of the perm web because all of these protocols are open and anyone can interact with them. It's, I think it's going to look basically like composability did in DeFi during the last summer would be my guess is, is the explosion that's going to happen or is kind of already happening or the early stages of it. Um, it's just yep. it looks slightly different because this time it's about data rather than about money, or at least actually sometimes data and money, the linkage between the two, but not just money, which is pretty interesting. Um, speaking of, I think there's, there's something you didn't mention, but I think it's super cool and not many people know about in the ecosystem. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about activity logs in Community XYZ. Yeah, so activity is something that uh, we started, uh, uh, we, we released it, I think it has been maybe two months ago, something like that. So it's fairly new. Uh, but yeah, pretty much every community 
or even any project at all, like anything, anything at all, uh, could uh, have these activities that are then shown on top of uh, your community, for example, if you have a community. But yeah, you can uh, interact also by going into a wallet, into someone's wallet, and then you are able to see those activities that are happening. Uh, on top of a community XYZ, you are able to go to those wallets and you are able to see that. Uh, but yeah, pretty much anyone can implement it. And yeah, I when I created that idea, uh, it came by doing pretty much a standard. So it doesn't have anything related to community XYZ on the tags. So they, they it's only a few tags that you add into your own transaction that you are normally sending. So for example, for let's say our drive, they create a transaction to submit uh, content onto the permaweb to deploy the content. They just need to add a few extra tags for that exact content. And then it will appear on the activities that X person uh, deployed X file, for example, if they want to do it that way. So yeah, and yeah, I tried to make it as standard as possible so anyone can use it uh, since yeah. I don't want it just to be for communities. Right, I mean, that's the exciting thing is essentially creating a logging standard, yeah, an open logging standard that any application can just add a couple of tags and then um, the, the interactions with their application can be openly auditable by people. And that, you know, when you and I were having the first conversations about you know, what a supporting uh, interface for profit sharing communities would look like, one of the things that was obvious was, you know, we need somewhere where people can vote. Another thing that was obvious was we also need like open uh, transparency about what is happening in the applications because this is like um, web startups, web two startups, except anyone can be a stakeholder and the community collectively owns and operates them. And so having that ability for everyone to see what's happening inside the application on a day-to-day -day or even real-time basis, super, super cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, and sorry, go on. Yeah, and as you mentioned, in fact, all of this, it's already open. So if we go, for example, into view block, we are able to see what's happening uh, a little bit, let's say. But it's not as easy as just going and having the exact detail of what's happening. You need to go track things out and everything. So yeah, having a logging system, as you mentioned, mm. uh, makes a lot of sense and it's a lot easier because yeah, even for example, for DAOs on Ethereum, uh, you can go and track things on what's happening in that DAO, but it's a lot harder because you need to go and check the blockchain itself, the transactions itself. Right. Yeah, and I think what's nice about this is you've got elegant formatting in it as well for human readable, um, what would you say, human readable events, basically. So ViewBlock can easily integrate this and then just have an, you know, an applications tag if they so wanted to, uh, as well yeah. as transactions. And then they just show a log of all of the interactions with the application, the TX ID, but then a human readable print of like, what was this thing that happened uh, in the app? It, it's really cool. I think um, a lot more founders will pick it up when they when yeah. they read about it, <laughs> but that yeah. I'm guessing is going to be when when it's on the R wiki. Uh, yeah. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, uh, where you think the the profit sharing community ecosystem is going. You know, over the next few years, and like <laughs> uh, predictions are very dangerous. But if you could project yeah. out five years, what would you expect to see? Yeah, you know, when we're at Arcon six or twelve, whether we do it, you know, like. Uh, Yearly yeah. Or yearly. Um, yeah. What do you expect we'll be thinking about and talking about then? Uh, well, I find it really, really difficult uh, to predict the future on the crypto space because everything grows and it moves so fast, so quickly. Um, but I think, for example, NFTs, it's something that uh, it's here to stay. I think it will move a little bit on what it is right now. I think it will evolve into something else maybe or just grow to something else. Uh, but um, yeah, I think they are here to stay. So what, that's one of the things that I'm pretty excited to see uh, what will be uh, an NFT in five years from now, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, for the communities, the profit sharing communities also, I'm pretty sure it will grow pretty fast. Like one of the things I cannot wait to see is that um, new contracts uh, start existing uh, that could interact with that community, but that has different sets of rules 
that are defined since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, because right now we have one contract that works, for example, with uh, profit sharing communities, how we know it right now. But I already see many uh, different approaches that could happen into this contract and iterate it and make something else uh, on it. Uh, and yeah, I think it's really, really difficult to know what will happen uh, in five years. But one thing also I'm pretty sure, at least from my side, is that we are still at the very beginning on all of this. So I, I'm really, really excited to see how the entire ecosystem, not just for communities, but also for the entire Airwave ecosystem, uh, will grow and what's coming next. Yeah. It's really, really fun. Yeah, yeah and, and I think you're right. Um, one of the interesting things about Community XYZ is, again, it's an open protocol, or it's like an open interface, really, where you can actually plug in whatever kind of contract you want on the back end. So most people are just using the standard um, you know, profit-sharing community contract right now. But very very possibly, you can just you know, uh, implement something new or have new dynamics. Um, and I think exactly. Amplify, who we're going to hear from later, yeah, they, their profit-sharing community has completely different dynamics baked into it. But of course, it's compatible with that user interface. It's really exactly, yeah. As long as you have the basics of a profit sharing community, so transfer, vote, mm -hmm. mint, mint lock, uh, you can, in fact, build anything else on top of it. Uh, and it will work right from the uh, dashboard also for the basic uh, functionalities that I mentioned just now. Yeah, yeah amazing. That, that's really cool. And you, you even see it going the other way already. So ViewBlock now has integration for votes from profit sharing communities, which originated from the community XYZ contracts. It's very cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I think they have integrated also a little bit of the activities. Mm. Uh, you mentioned the activities. I uh, because I noticed that they have the categories. Uh, the activities have, have a category, and it, ha it has a description which explains uh, what exactly happened. Mm. I didn't see the description, but I saw the, the, the categories, for example, transfer, uh, mint, yes. log, things like that, yeah. Oh, I see, yeah. I think they're, they're extracting the function call name there. Uh, but yeah. we, I'm sure the ViewBlock guys are around here somewhere. We could probably ask them afterwards. Yeah, anyway, for sure. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for <laughs> spreading some of your uh, wisdom, Cedric. Anything else you, you want to talk about? Uh, just one other thing. Keep building, keep growing the ecosystem. And yeah, as Tate mentioned at the beginning, uh, if you have any questions, if you need any help, just feel free to ask. Uh, we are a really, really uh, fun community, uh, and we are always happy to help everyone. So yeah, just let's chat. Let's keep growing and keep building uh, amazing stuff on top of our RWIF. Amazing. Thanks so much, Cedric. Thank All you. Right. Um, yes, so maybe. Said you could uh, welcome the next uh, people on, on the stage. I've been concentrating, so I'm not sure who's up next. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, <laughs> thank you both. <laughs> thank you both for, for that cool fireside chat. And next up, we have uh, Brennan. Brennan is going to talk to us. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, and yeah, you're going to be you're going to be presenting a little bit. Brennan, you're also going to be presenting later on at demo day. But for now, just take it away, man. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, oh, one sec. All right. Uh, so yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, bringing Web3 to the Web2 community. Uh, just first off, <clears throat> thank you guys so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and yeah, I just, I've been really impressed with everything so far. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Brennan Lamy. Uh, I have an engineering background, uh, you know, a little bit of computer science, but I've been, you know, picking that up over the past year. Uh, I'm very new to the Rweave community. You know, I had been looking around for a couple couple months, um, sort of trying to throw together a sustainable business model. You know, looking at opportunities um, to give you an idea of how new I am. I am currently one week into the two week notice I gave my employer, uh, so that I can come and do this full time. So I'm very new. Uh, my project is called Ecclesia, but that's not really what I'm here to talk to you guys about today. Um, I'm actually here to talk to you guys about something that I'm I'm actually probably more excited about this talk than the Ecclesia talk because I think it's a very interesting discussion. Um, so to start, we can uh, we can sort of just cover crypto adoption. Um, in the recent bull run, we've seen crypto gain wide scale, you know, commercial fairly wide scale commercial adoption. 
Uh, Tesla now accepts payments in Bitcoin. Visa can now settle transactions with USDC. PayPal accepts crypto. Coinbase just recently IPO'd and is currently valued more than I believe any bank. And so what that means is that, you know, different from the 2017 bull run, crypto really is here to stay because now it's it's being tied into pre-existing, you know, societal systems. But what that really means is that, you know, the top cryptos are guaranteed to stay. For all intents and purposes, we'll just call this Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, obviously, what everyone here is interested in is, does that include our weave? And I think a better way to uh, to visualize this would be to look at the technology adoption lifecycle. Um, so to sort of just briefly cover the technology adoption lifecycle, it starts with uh, innovators. You know, innovators, they come, they build the new system, um, and, you know, they really, uh, they love the building aspect. You know, I'd say that's a lot of people who are here. Then there are the early adopters. Early adopters still love, you know, they love the technological challenge. They love the learning curve. They know that there's problems with the technology, but they see the promise. Next, you have the early majority. You know, this is the first major, uh, major population where it gains wide scale adoption. Um, you know, later you have the later majority who, you know, they're maybe not itching to get in on new technology. They'll use it if it's convenient and if they really have to. Um, but, you know, in general, they, they'll be coming a lot later in the life cycle. And then finally, you have the laggards where just on a you know, pound for pound basis, probably not worthwhile trying to chase down laggards. Maybe they come in, maybe they don't. Uh, the chasm is uh, something that was proposed in Geoffrey Moore's book, Crossing the Chasm. Uh, I would highly recommend you guys read it because uh, I think it could do a lot to change your perspective on sort of where crypto is going, especially after this bull run, because it can't, can't go up forever. Um, and so the chasm, which I'll dive into you know, a little more later, is essentially where tech fails. You know, uh, a lot of tech startups, they will reach the early adopter stage. But for them to reach early majority, there are some extra, th extra things that need to take place. And he calls this the chasm. To sort of put the technology adoption lifecycle into more concrete terms, uh, we can sort of look at where current cryptos are measuring up. Uh, so Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, I would say probably just recently passed into, you know, the early majority. Uh, they're being integrated into, you know, current systems, you know, Visa, PayPal, um, Tesla. And so they're, they're here to stay. Um, Next, you know, in, you know, the late early adopter cycle, you know, we have like Solana and Filecoin, you know, Filecoin has been getting a lot of press from the Chinese government for, for good. Um, it's been, it's been helping them. You know, Solana has Serum and, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of fairly big name projects being built on top of them, but they certainly have not crossed over into the, uh, into the mainstream. Uh, they're here to stay, you know, there still is something that could go wrong with their adoption. Uh, I would put our weave right in between the innovators and the early adopters. And so the main reason I do that is just looking at the demographics of the people here who are here today. There are a lot of people who are here who are building the Web3 ecosystem. And there are also a lot of people here who are, they're not necessarily building the ecosystem, but they're utilizing the ecosystem to advance, you know, their other projects. I think a great example of this, and we're going to hear from them later, is uh, Arcade City, you know, pre-existing business, um, but they're coming to our weave to integrate uh, because they see the value out of it. That's an early adopter. And so currently, our weave is building for early adopters. And that's absolutely a good thing. But we have to keep looking towards the future and see what does our weave need to do in order to achieve early majority status. Um, the main thing that's stopping someone from you know, achieving the early majority is the chasm. Uh, the chasm is where tech fails to reach mainstream adoption. How it goes is you know, innovators, they come, they begin building, and early adopters sort of follow. You know, if you build it, the early adopters will come. And our weave is currently building for early adopters. And that's a great thing. You know, it's a very critical part in the adoption process. But what a lot of people fail to recognize is that the early majority does not have the same incentives as an early adopter and they will not come to you. Um, you know, to paraphrase Geoffrey Moore, people often fail to see that appealing to the early majority is very different from appealing to early adopters. adopters. It's just fundamentally a different strategy. And so as we start approaching the chasm as a community, it's important to see what we need to do to make sure that we don't fall into that chasm. Uh, so to specifically lay out what the chasm would look like for our weave, um, and you know, this is my personal opinion, you know, there's several different ways to look at this, but um, there's two ways we can split it up. One is for the learning curve, and two is for the technical limitations of our weave. So first for the learning curve, um, you know, users have to you know, manage their wallets, have to understand what a crypto wallet is and signing transactions. You know, that, that's just a part of Web3 and that's you know, a, necessary, a necessary process. Uh, second is buying crypto, you know, going through an exchange, 
the easiest way for you know someone to get cryptocurrency, which is something that you know AR is running into right now, and then requiring a user to understand crypto. Um, next down to the technical limitations. Our weave has a lot of scalable potential, but in its current state is not super scalable. Um, and the reason I say this is because, uh, you know, 1,000 transactions per block, a rough block time of two minutes. And so that you're getting about 8.3 transactions per second. Um, there's also, you know, a problem and it kind of comes and goes with rejected transactions. But the good news for our weave is that there's a very clear path forward to building around this technical limitation. Um, first, to start with, you know, the learning curve and building for the early majority, there's really two things that will uh, that the RWEV ecosystem needs to do to build for the early majority, provide high utility and as low a learning curve as possible. Um, for, for, you know, my, my DAP, Ecclesia, uh, that would mean no wallet management, you know, users don't need to know what a wallet is um, in order to use it. They don't need to go through an exchange or use VPN. When I had to go and get, you know, RWEV to begin developing, I made a Coinbase account, bought Bitcoin, got a VPN, connected to MXC, transferred my Bitcoin there, bought our weave, and transferred to my account. Users aren't going to do that. Um, I know. I mean, for Ecclesia, our general, our goal is to have you know, one minute onboarding times, uh, and that's really just because we don't think the early majority is going to uh, is going to put in the effort to reach our technology, especially when there's so many other great alternatives, well, semi great alternatives in the Web two world. Uh, overall, I guess you could characterize it as users should not need a prior knowledge of crypto in order to use our platform to its fullest. And obviously this, you know, sort of wanes depending on what you're building. You know, if you're building something regarding NFTs or, uh, or you know, rewarding users with cryptocurrency, then that changes a little bit. But uh, just, you know, for our use case, as an example, for Ecclesia's use case, that's sort of what we're looking at for building for the early majority. <clears throat> now, we have a couple of solutions. This is one that I've put together, uh, and it's basically a small encryption library that uh, it's, it's in JavaScript, and it allows for users to store their uh, Rweave uh, private key on Rweave. Um, it does this through using AES-256 encryption. It uses the username as a password salt, so this makes it uh, you know, protected against rainbow hash tables. Uh, if that sounds a little confusing to you, it's very similar to what Phil brought up about uh, our drive earlier in their encrypted system. It's a very similar system uh, to the end user. It's just a typical username password flow. Uh, so we have this done, and uh, you know, you guys are welcome to use this if you want. Uh, there's no fees. Uh, if you guys want to use it, definitely just come use it. Um, and so I haven't released it publicly. The main reason is I haven't had time to put together a uh, a security guide to make sure that you know you don't you don't use it incorrectly and then lose all your AR. But if you want to use this, uh, reach out to me and I'll just kind of tell you what you need to make sure you don't do so that you use this correctly. Um, another solution for crossing the chasm, this is something that we have not built, this is a little more prospective, would be a bundler system. And this is where solving the technical limitations of our weave would, be, uh, would have some major potential. How, how, how I would envision something like this is, you know, it would set, accept data, it would bundle the items, it would, uh, you know, they'd compete to submit it to the RWE blockchain. The person submitting it would submit USDC, which is held in a Solidity smart contract, and that's awaiting an oracle that can essentially prove that the bundled items have been mined onto the RWE blockchain. This solves the problem of the rejected transaction IDs. Uh, and also for those that aren't aware, um, bundles in Arweave, they, uh, you can bundle, I mean, near arbitrary amounts of transactions. I think Sam once told me that they bundled 600,000 transactions into one bundle and submit it to the Arweave blockchain. And uh, it counts on the Arweave blockchain as just one transaction. And so this is how Arweave can essentially achieve infinite scalability um, while also solving the rejected transaction IDs. These bundlers would also make crypto highly available to users because uh, you know, the bundler would be submitting their own AR and in exchange take something that's way easier for people to get like USDC. You know, there's a lot of uh, fiat to crypto APIs that you know, support USDC, Matic-based USDC. It can run through the smart contracts. Um, and has near zero transaction fees. That's just one example. Um, and then finally, you know, you'd want to integrate this with the gateway. To be clear, uh, this is not something I've built yet. Um, and if I do build this, it will not be part of Ecclesia. It will be for the entire RWEV ecosystem. This is just one means to go about an end of crossing the chasm so that the RWEV ecosystem can reach broader adoption. Uh, and so what this really boils down to, at least in my mind, is uh, the community's fight for permanence. And this isn't permanence on the RV blockchain. This is for permanence in, uh, in, general, in general society. You know, we're in a major crypto bull run right now. And virtually every crypto that's you know, worth anything is gaining immense traction. 
but this can't go up forever. And uh, when the dust settles, I don't think there will be as many mainstream cryptos as there are right now. Uh, and that kind of begs the question, what cryptos will remain once you know crypto becomes more normalized and it's not in such a hyped up bull run? If you buy into the technology adoption lifecycle, then the logical answer for that is those who build for mass utility and mass use will be the ones who are there remaining at the end of the day. You know, that's what made Henry Ford's Model T successful. That's what made Steve Jobs' personal computer successful. I believe that if the community acts uh, correctly, that's what will make our week successful. Um, you know, obviously there are some things here that can certainly be left up to interpretation and there's a lot of different ways for going about this. And so I'd really love to discuss with people on how they think the best way to go about this would be. If you agree with me, if you, you know, think I might have somewhat missed the mark or you want to discuss some possible solutions, my contact info is right there because I'd really love to talk to you guys about how we can achieve bringing our weave into the, into the mainstream because I think that's something that's just vitally important for technology that not a lot of people have in the forefront of their minds. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for that. Yeah, lots of interesting points there. I think you're 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 correct on the um, uh, well on the on the challenge ahead, I suppose. Uh, in terms of scalability, I think there's like two sides of this. There's there's data storage scalability, which you absolutely point out. Basically, the answer is uh, bundled TXs, and we're gonna need better infrastructure for that. Um, but I, I already know of a team in the ecosystem working on this, and I, I think there are at least a couple of others that are um, yeah excited to do so. Um, oh. Someone's, someone's ring. Um, yeah, and on the on the financial transaction side, we I think we just go with something that's basically similar to Bitcoin and Ethereum. So the idea is not necessarily to kill banks, but to to kill central banks. Um, and I think that's a reasonable enough um, trade off to make. But yes, yeah, super interesting uh, um, food for thought there. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, and a, a lot of stuff to discuss later too. I think. Um, okay, so next up, I believe, is the lone Ronin with Amplify. Yo, Ronin, you here? Hey. How's it going? Uh, Hello? Hey, hey, buddy. Yeah, there you go. You're on. Hey, okay, great. Yeah, so actually, I'm going to be talking not really about Amplify specifically, but uh, about really just about databases in general here one sec it's uh uh you okay there running you would we could hear you uh now we cannot hmm okay um Give it a, a minute or so. This is actually our last presentation in the in the founder. Ah, oh. <laughs> that's unfortunate. Ronan has disappeared from the stage. <laughs> All right. Well, um, the next the next thing we should go to, I think, is the demo day talks. So these are from um, projects that have been building in the ecosystem for the first time, typically in in the last six weeks or so, and are just ready to present to the outside world, or at least our slightly larger collective family. Um, than than previously. So uh, some of these projects have been uh, yeah taking part in these open demo sessions we've been having every Friday as part of the incubator, um, but others you won't have heard from at all. So so this is really exciting stuff. See what's new in the ecosystem. Um, yeah, maybe Seb, you can you can take it away and take us through the rundown here. And if if Ronan comes back at some point, maybe he's going to teleport in on top of me. I'll move to the side. <laughs> um, yeah, then, then I guess we can jump back to him, or perhaps ha have his talk after the the block of uh, demo day presenters, perhaps. Sure, we we can play it a little bit by ear, depending on uh, connectivity uh, issues that might present. Yeah, um, we're super excited to to present the the teams that have been going through the six, well, actually like seven week program, um, and that and that we were hosting the Open oh. Boundaries. <laughs> And oh, there we go. There we go. Um, Ronan's back. <laughs> might as well. <laughs> <laughs> Ronan, we were just about to move on. But uh, yeah. If you're there, Ronan, you can take it away. Sorry about that. Yeah, literally, my computer. Yeah, my computer crashed. So. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, are you going to share your screen? Yeah, I'm sharing. 
Oh, perfect. We can see. Okay. Okay. Yep. Great. Great. So I'm actually going to be talking about databases in general, since that's what I've been working a lot on. Amplify is is dealing with. Um, um, well, not it's not really a large database. Like the data set I'm working with is a few hundred gigabytes, but um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is to make sure that it works well at terabyte, well, like at terabyte scale, and uh, hopefully in the future maybe exabyte. But uh, you know, I, I think that's I think that's probably going to be a sharded strategy at the exabyte scale. Anyway, so. This talk is going to be mostly about um, just like general uh, guidelines and suggestions to optimize your database and and basically just how to how to make a solid fast database. So um, yeah, you know, like I said, like big databases, they can get slow pretty fast, and um, with the incorrect data structures, you can get queries uh, even locking up with like a few gigabytes worth of rows. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're gonna need a decent around, amount of RAM, uh, like no matter what, but uh, uh, even even at terabyte scale, if, if, you have, if you have the indexing structure, if you have indexes structured in a way, uh, efficiently that is, um, you can you can still have fast queries even with like 16 or, or 32 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, and another thing is is having subqueries uh, is also a great way to you know really reduce uh, lock times on 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 your database in general. So um, I think I think something that does I think something that is pretty frequently discussed in in just database databases in general is database normalization. And there's basically these, there's like first normal form, second normal form, and and so all the way to sixth normal form. And uh, yeah, basically first normal form is when every column is just in one table. So it's like, it's extremely unstructured. And then sixth normal form is just the complete opposite where Every column is its own table, essentially, and it's indexed uh, in its own table. So, you know, first normal form, you're, you're going to have probably a smaller database in general, but and, and, and obviously, six normal form is going to tend to be a lot larger given the amount of uh, indexing per column. But um, you can still have like a performant database even with second or third normal form. Um, but this is mostly because like uh, MongoDB, Postgres, and MySQL. These these databases provide um, useful indexing tools uh, to actually basically kind of replicate that six normal form efficiency that that it has. Like it, essentially, when you put an index on, say, your your MySQL or Postgres database, you're technically creating this six normal form. Uh, <laughs> Six normal form kind of uh, uh, secondary column. It's just not explicitly shown in your database structure, and it's just shown as like an index for that table. So, um, a large reason why six normal form in comparison to first normal form scales so well is because it leverages like integers for sorting and ordering data, and and you know, I think a really good way to to like a good analogy to understand why uh, six normal form is so much better is just looking at the amount of bytes required to store a string in comparison to an unsigned integer. For that same one byte, you can store thirty thousand values in an integer, whereas for a string, you can only store one character. So I think you know. Just that representation alone kind of alludes to um, why why six normal form is so powerful, just given how efficient and how much smaller, you know, well per index that <laughs> per index that you have to deal with, uh, as opposed to say you know indexing, um, you know, a, a relatively large uh, text file, for example. So when it comes to indexing strategies. Uh, there, 
there's really there's a lot there's a few things you got to keep in mind like um when it comes to like big big o notation and stuff we all like you know i think the supposition is that you know o1 o1 time complexity is the best but uh when you're dealing with big data oftentimes o1 is can actually be like the worst because <laughs> uh because you know if you're dealing with terabytes worth of data um o1 is actually like o1 time complexity even though that's technically the most efficient uh when it comes to um like actual uh, queries, it's it's actually if you're dealing with a terabyte data set, it's completely it doesn't even work. You can't even effectively use it because you're going to have no RAM, and then you're going to have to page to disk, and then yeah, basically you you break your database. So I think a really good analogy uh, to use is is of of why uh, of why like you don't you have to consider like other things other than time complexity is just the difference between like binary trees and, and hash tables. So like in post trees, there's the B tree and the hash indexing strategy. And uh, actually, usually the, the binary tree is going to outperform the hash because uh, it, it, it's, it depends on the size of the hash table. Like the hash table will outperform on, on a smaller data set, but the binary tree will outperform on a larger data set. And this is because the binary tree can traverse that data set in a ring buffer. And with a ring buffer, you don't need to store the entire data set in memory and you can just, you know, uh, basically pipe data in sequentially and, you know, you don't have to run out of RAM scanning the, <laughs> the database. So that's just something to keep in mind. Like, you know, you have to think about like how exactly how exactly does this indexing strategy, or like basically your scanning strategy, it doesn't have to be you know binary tree specifically. Um, how exactly does it work, and like how much memory does it take to do a scan, and and those kind of things? Because like like I said with the hash table, um, the hash tables are essentially unusable um, at terabyte scale because you literally need a terabyte worth of of RAM just to even use the index. So yeah. <laughs> So I guess in conclusion, um, yeah, you know, I, like general general suggestions for you guys is like subqueries can help a lot for optimizing, you know, more complex queries that, you know, might want to take up a lot of RAM. Uh, and then, you know, six normal form, uh, it, it helps you structure your database to be highly performant. It's not that you shouldn't be against second or third normal form database structures. It's just, uh, you know, six normal form will will make sure that you're, <laughs> you know, you have you have an efficient structure, and uh, yeah, you know, another thing avoid in, avoiding indexing strings, you know, indexing unsigned integers. Like that's, you know, I think that should be a given with just the analogy of how much you can store in a byte uh, with a string versus an integer. And then, yeah, you know, consider the scale of the, the table and how operations need to perform on the table. And, and, and you know, like, like the example with the binary tree and the ring buffers, uh, like you don't need to store the entire index in memory to do that. And, and oftentimes that, that'll outperform um, the hash table. So those, those type of things you need to consider too. So. Yeah, anyway, that, that's all I want to talk about. I know it's not about Amplify specifically, but I thought, you know, I thought it'd be nice to just share share this information uh, <laughs> for the for the Aircom. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ronan. That's awesome. <laughs> There's ComSci lesson for us there. We were actually just discussing in the chat how the uh, the complexity classes of all this stuff uh, interact. And, and the work you're doing to, to optimize gateway performance is like a godsend to, to everyone here. Like this is the core are we family and it's like over a hundred people and we're all thankful for the stuff you're doing it it, it it is imperative to basically all of the applications talk about a stack of protocols well amplify and the gateways it's like right near the bottom basically just on top of the are we base protocol literally everything uses it so thanks again for your work you're doing amazing stuff there um all right so i think seb is now going to take us through the rundown um for the open web foundry demo day really excited about this, this is Cool projects everywhere. 